What's up, Stokers? Before we begin this podcast, I want to let you know that we are brought to you by our dudes at Rumple. Rumple is our new favorite blanket made to go anywhere you go. Rumple's original puffy blanket is made sustainably with the same quality materials as your favorite puffy jacket. So whether you're hitting the beach or camping in the mountains, Rumple has you covered. Literally. They've got cool designs and packable products for that on-the-go lifestyle. Get yours at rumple.com. Enter code D15 for 15% off your first order. That's rumple.com dot com r-u-m-p-l with code deep 15 for 15 percent off your first order we are also brought to you by our legends at helix sleep what up helix big shout out to helix sleep take their two minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a mattress that'll give you the best sleep of your life helix is offering up to 200 dollars off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash go deep Gotta check them out, dudes. And of course, we are brought to you by the legends at Manscaped. Manscaped, thank you so much for keeping our trims pubed, for looking after our hogs, for making sure that our dongs are looking fresh and clean. And most of all, thank you for keeping our do- our, our dad's pubes trimmed. Because Father's Day is coming and the weather is catching heat. Whether you have a dad bod or rocking the six pack, make sure you, you and your dad are smelling nice and shade where it matters most. I'm talking about your hog. So make your dad proud this year and get him and yourself a Manscaped Lawnmower 4.0 and the Refined Cologne by Manscaped. The brand new Lawnmower 4.0, yes, 4.0, check it out. And Refined Cologne is per- perfect for you and your dad in your life to complete your grooming game. So get 20% off plus free shipping with the code GODEEP20 at manscaped.com. All right, let's start the show. Okay, I'm going into the mid rolls now. What's up, guys? I'm interrupting this podcast to let you know once again that we are brought to you by Rumple. Rumple, what up? Rumple is on a mission to introduce the world to better blankets. If you're on a surf ski trip through California, Rumple's founders. Oh, actually, while on a surf and ski trip, owners were on a surf and ski trip. You already know they're cool. So listen to more of this story. Their founders found themselves stuck in the back of their van in sub zero temperatures. Very cool, dudes. And while drinking whiskey and trying to keep warm, they had a crazy idea. The sleeping bag blanket. What? And now they're sharing their discovery with the world while also helping the environment. The Rumple original puffy blanket is made with the same materials found in premium outdoor gear and active wear. The blankets are built for everywhere, whether you're on the beach, in the van, at a music festival, chilling with your dank GF, with your dank fiance, with your dank homies, with your, you know, dank BF, um, dank whatever. You can add in Rumple into it and that'll make it dank times two and you'll be cozy. So, and they're sustainable. They help the environment. Uh, they're made from 60 deca- discarded plastic bottles. Say later to plastic in terms of that and what up to plastic in terms of your blanket, but it's cool. Uh, and they also donate to beach-friendly nonprofits like Save the Waves. Check these guys out, man. I've been using them. I've, you know, I've been super comfy in my rumple and uh, just watch Under Siege with it. And it was it made it 10 times better. So check it out. Go to rumple.com and enter code DEEP15 for 15% off your first order. These blankets are unlike any other, so check them out. R-U-M-P-L.com. Enter code DEEP15 for 15% off your first order. That's rumple, R-U-M-P-L.com with code DEEP15 for 15% off your first order. We are also brought to you by the legends at Helix Sleep. Helix, what up? Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Guys, I know, you know, Times are weird. Things are opening up. You're probably super excited. You're ready to rage, but you, in order to rage well, you need good sleep. Sleeping on a terrible mattress before the summer of love comes is not chill. So um, yeah, check out Helix if you really want to maximize this summer. They have a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete, matches your body type and sleep references to the perfect mattress for you. And uh, everyone's unique. Helix knows that. So they have soft, medium, firm. They're great for cooling down if you sleep hot. And they also have ones for plus size folks. They got everything. So take that Helix quiz. They'll get ma- they'll match you with a model and it'll be legit. Guys, I am using a Helix mattress right now. I loved my mattress before and I was like, I don't know if Helix is going to beat it. And guess what, guys? It did. It beat it big time. Best sleep I've ever had. So if you're looking for a mattress, take the quiz. Helix is awesome, but don't take my word for it. They're num- awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 and by GQ and Wired Magazine. So you know they're legit. 
go to helixsleep.com slash go deep, take the two minute sleep quiz. And they're offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash go deep. Check them out, helixsleep.com slash go deep. Finally, we are brought to you by the legends at Manscaped. Manscaped, thank you so much for keeping our trims peed, for looking after our hogs, for making sure that our dongs are looking fresh and clean because you got a dong, you got genitalia, which means you've got pubes and you got to look after those pubes because this is a modern age and we got the lawnmower 4.0. And guess what? Your dad also has pubes. Yeah, I'm talking about your dad's junk and he wants the lawnmower 4.0. So get it for him for Father's Day. They got advanced skin safe technology, um, a 4,000K LED spotlight just for your nuts. It's waterproof. You can shave in the dark. You can trim your, with, you know, you got different guard lengths, size one through four, wireless charging system. I, I'm popping a Woody just thinking about all this stuff. Guys, time to pull the plug on wire trimmers and your wild bush. And also for your dad. So if, after you guys have clean balls, clean up your cologne game with the refined cologne from Manscaped. I mean, these guys are just taking it to a whole new level. Get it for your dad. Let him trim his pubes and also smell good with the lawnmower 4.0 and the cologne, all that good stuff. So choose Manscaped right now for your below the belt needs. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code GODEEP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code GODEEP20. Don't forget that you came from your dad's balls this year. Show your original home some love with Manscaped. All right. That's it. Thank you, dudes. Back to the show. Okay. Flip the pancakes and let me see the maple. What's up, Stokers of Stoke Nation? This is Chad Kroger coming in with the Go and Diva Chad and JT podcast. I'm here with my compadre, Jean Thomas. What up? Boom clap, Stokers. And we are here with, for the fourth time, this is your fourth time, right? I'm so happy to be here. I, you know, I'm every, it, it, they all roll into one of another. <laughs> yeah. Kind of. It's know? a little bit like SNL where like if you're a four time host, I think that's a big distinction. That's like Paul Simon. Is that Tom true? Hanks. Yeah. Yeah. John Goodman. Well, there's other the guys. Hitters. Well, there are other guys. I, I mean, you know, Strider and Joe. I mean, mm-hmm. how many times have they been on? They're in the cast, though. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're, they're like kind of, yeah, they're in the world, I guess. Mm-hmm. But but so are you, though. I would say for That's someone who's not frequently in, in content with us, yeah. you're, you're the most in this yeah. content. And a fan yeah. favorite. Well, that's nice to say because yeah. I love coming here. I mean, you guys call me, I'll show up anytime. You know that. Oh, we appreciate should I not it. say that on camera? I guess I should. No, no, no it's really hard to get or yeah. something, but I really do love coming to do the show. I love it. Um, you don't but, have to play hard to get. <laughs> <laughs> We've been trying to get you for six months. Um, well, it's an honor to have you here. How are things going? Um, you know, pretty good. Um, yeah. It's. Uh, it feels like the last time I was here, we were kind of in the middle of COVID or front middle of covid right mm-hmm. yeah was it january god was it was it that long ago january february wow. <laughs> and so now here we are um feels like we're coming out there's movies coming out in yeah. movie theaters life is yeah. different well, i mean there's, sure. there's been a, a switch i think in in most places i've been to lately where you can tell people are ready to get after it they're ready to forget about it and they're ready for a lot of excitement so it's a little bit like America after World War One and Two, I guess. I think so. Yeah, yeah that's interesting because, you know, many people who are here and listening have never been through those two things. I would imagine. Right. This is the biggest collective crisis for Americans, I think, since World War Two. That's me quoting the New York Times verbatim. Well, I'm but happy to be coming them. out of it and doing it with you two guys. Why are you saying? Why are you nine eleven? Oh, I was going to say yeah, but that wasn't necessarily collective. Right. So I think you're right. I think. Or because it was a year. This was a year, too. At first, when you shook your head, no, I was like, what else could it be? But then I thought of that and I was like, that was pretty bad. Yeah, it was a big deal, but it it wasn't. It didn't. uh, Not everyone was in 9 11. Right. Right. Oh, right. 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 (laughs) Right. That's a good distinction, Aaron. Thank you. (laughs) Well, and then so you're you're coming out of this big. You have a a film coming out. It'll come out uh, before this podcast comes out, but. A movie you've worked on for years is is about to hit the theaters. Yeah, I mean that's a really weird thing. It's like uh, you know you prepare for something, and we uh, we got right to the gate, and then they they pulled the. We should say what the movie is, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, A Quiet Place Part Two. 
Uh, and so, uh, good reviews. <laughs> yeah. It's looking good. It's certified fresh, which I'm very, you know, I haven't had a lot of certified fresh movies, so oh, it's nice. nice to have that. Let's go. Uh, the, the trailer, I've been to the movies twice so far. The trailers, uh, it's been on both the trailers, been on both movies. It's out of this world. I think I remember yeah. when you saw that scene, it was like after the first time you came on the pod and we went outside and you're like, John shot this scene in a car yep. and like, it's yep. amazing. And that became kind of the, the crux of the trailer, right? Listen, the, yeah, that's, that sequence is, was so amazing. And, um, you know, to the, to the, to the stokers who really kind of are film fans, the great thing about it is it was kind of one shot. Right. Mm. And, and, and I think if you've seen the trailer, well, it, people will know what we're talking about, but there's this, Emily is driving her car and a bus comes barreling towards her. Now, that's how it looks, but that's what was really happening. Like it was all orchestrated. We had stunt people, but Emily was behind the wheel of that car. Mm. The kids were in the car. The bus decimated a car before it almost hit Emily, and then she pulled it in reverse. Now we had a stunt driver who was above her helping her to drive. Mm. But as a producer, above her, like sitting on the car? On the roof of the car. Wow. And they're in like a harness? Yeah. Yeah, like a sprint car. You know, like a little sprinter car? Like on top of the car. That was that that rig is up there and he's, and so, he's controlling it. He's controlling it. Wow. And, uh, but Emily was in the car and that was a real bus and it was moving fast towards yeah. her. And, 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 and that's as much anxiety as I've ever felt on set because mm. you, you know, if something goes wrong, you got your three stars in there and you know, thank God it worked out and we were done. Like, so you got your headset on, you're at video village, you're looking on, but, the- but we shot it actually on, on a street. So I could see it, I could see it with my eyes, and then wow. I could see what the cameras were seeing in Video Village. And how many chances do you get for that shot? Only one. So you we did a pickup. We did a pickup after, just because we the, the combustion on the bus hitting the car. We wanted to make that a little bit better, but for the most part, it was a oneer. I mean, it's definitely a oneer. We did it one and a half times. Hmm. And is that the whole day? Is that um, shot, or is that? You know, I think it was half the day. I mean, rigging that. I mean, the the earlier part of the day is also in the trailer, as I'm recalling. It was a long time ago now. It was almost two years ago when we were shooting it. Um, is the scene where John walks up to the police car, and then the police car, you have to rig that police car to flip. That mm. That's a big rig, um, which, which took some time. But we we shot in that that little, I guess it's like a little neighborhood for about a week. And how scripted is the car accident? Like, did it, when you read the script, did it come out close to what was written? It's, it was better the way we shot it. I mean, I, I can never visualize things as well as I can see them. So when I saw it, I just felt to my, you know, I, I spent 20 years with Michael Bay. So I'm used to reading about mayhem and then mayhem gets a lot better mm. when, when Bay shoots it. And, and this was that, I mean, I know Emily was driving, a bus was almost going to hit her, but when you see it happening, you, you can't believe that right. that it's actually happening. It's one of the things that I'm most proud of because yeah. of being a part of because it's a, it's a fantastic sequence. It's not only your lead actress too, who's a badass and a great a great actor. It's the director's wife as well. <laughs> right. Right. Like, yeah, and he's right shit. there. Yeah. Yeah. He was standing in the, as close as JT is to me right now. It was yeah. you know. Yeah. It's, wow. it's and did he know you guys got it after? Yeah, we knew it. it yeah. Yes, yes. But you, but you know you got it. But you can always make it a little bit better, right? And right. so, is it worth the risk? And so, in that case, not that much. Yeah. Oh, so you ran it back all the way twice. We cut. I, I'm thinking back. Or you like I feel like we picked something bit? up. Yeah, I feel like we picked something up. But for the most part, it was all because it's a wonder. So you can't really cut in and out of it. Mm-hmm. So that, I was I was wondering about this because you know like. Uh, I forget her name. The lady who directed Nomadland, Chloe, yeah, Chloe Zhao. Zhao. Yeah. So she, her next movie is a Marvel movie. Correct. She's, so totally different scale from her first couple movies. And then like Ryan Fleck and Anna Bolden, they did like a lot of indie movies and then they did Captain Marvel. Yeah. And then so you like uh, worked with John on A Quiet Place, John Krasinski. Mm-hmm. I say it like I know him. And then, <laughs> I'm picking up your familiarity. Thank you. Um, then how do you guys know that these directors are capable of stepping into like a bigger production like that, that has like a lot more uh, like special effects and stuff of that nature. Well, you never know. You never know. Um, we have, when I say we, I'm referring to Bay and Drew and myself at Platinum Dunes. Michael's whole concept when we started that company was let's give first time directors the opportunity to make a movie for the, now, now the, the, the asterisk was a first time director was someone who had spent 500 days on set I've told you that um, mm-hmm. and so um, you take 
people who know their way around a set and who've done it, at least for us, that's what we did. And you surround them with great professionals, like super great professionals with a lot of experience. And, and, and it's been a pretty fruitful experience for us. I mean, taking someone who's never directed a movie and being a part of their first movie is kind of a magical thing to do. And mm-hmm. so um, there, there was nothing that Krasinski did before Quiet Place that said, to me yeah, he did brief interviews with hideous men right and the hollers and right? the hollers but those movies I, I was gonna say there's nothing that he did that spoke to his no ability way. to create tension right and, and, and the depth of the acting and all the wonderful things that he captured um but john is a very um he's just an amazing guy and he had the vision for it and it just felt to us like he was undeniable and are all these people, they got to be good in the room, right? Yeah. I'm assuming all these people I'm talking about. Not are. all of them, but John in particular is very good in the room. Very good in the room. Um, not all of them are, but a lot. I mean, you kind of do have to have that personality trait because people are following you. you got 150 people who are doing your bidding on a minute-by-minute basis. And if you're not a dynamic leader, it, they'll, it will start to fracture. Mm-hmm. Right, and not everyone is a dynamic leader, and sometimes a producer's job is to go to those fissures and fill them so that they don't get bigger. Um, but for the most part, the job calls for that type of personality where you can express yourself in a way that people understand it and can do what you have told them you want executed. Like right. that, that's part of that's part of the job. Mm-hmm. And I feel too like I think sometimes. Because uh, I watched I watched a behind the scenes thing on Goodfellas yesterday, mm-hmm. and then I watched Goodfellas. It was a really nice day. That's a good day. But uh, I think the thing that everyone said about Martin Scorsese is just like he's so prepared. Like he knows everything. Like he write he he looks at the script and he has like all the shots yeah. already made out in his head, and then he's already done prep with the actors on each scene so that the dialogue is like shaped the way he wants it, and he already has the songs in his head. Like he's so prepared, and I, I feel like that could be a substitute for. A natural charisma too right it's just being so passionate about what you're doing right. that it uh, translates into just competency I've had directors who do that there were, I have one director that I worked with uh, in an early part of his career Mike Flanagan um, who, who um, is, is a fantastic director and on first day of the sequel to our movie Ouija um, he, he directed the sequel he took me aside took out a huge notebook and he had every single camera move for the entirety wow. of the movie in his notebook broken down by day and broken down by where the camera was going to be so anyone who wanted to know what we're doing six days from now in the afternoon could look at this at a document and it would say camera's going to start here move to here we'll go in tight here and that is an amazing thing now um inversely there are other directors i've worked with who were kind of like today we're going to shoot this sequence Let's see how it goes and see how the actors are. Maybe we can capture this in a different way. Mm-hmm. And n- neither is better than the other. Mm-hmm. Um, it just depends on the group working together and the magic that is created by that, right? And so some actors love to know that three days from now they're going to have 14 close-ups and they should probably sleep more and not do anything, not eat any food that's going to make them swell. Puff you up. know, Others kind of, you know, they respond and just let's see what we're doing today and see how it goes. So mm-hmm. it just depends on, on the group and how the people uh, all interact together. But do you feel safer having the money be with the person who's got the whole thing already written out in the notebook or, I pro- or does that not matter if the movie doesn't come Listen, out? Listen, right? I probably, there was a time in my career when I would have taken comfort in that. Um, and it is an easier thing if the studio's on set with me and I, they have questions and I can open up this notebook and say, well, here's the answer. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's always better, right? Maybe I feel a little bit more comfortable, but it's not always better. So what do you do if you're, if you're like Francis Ford Coppola's, uh, producer when he's making, uh, apocalypse now. I don't even know how to process what you just said, but let's go with it. But you're overseas, You're you're overseas. He's like a year over schedule he's adding like new tangents yeah to like an already huge script yeah um you know he can't get brando on set right and like people are getting dysentery what do yes. you what do you do it i think the producer's job is to make sure that he's happy and that francis ford coppola is right. getting everything he needs so you just go to bat for france you have to the guy's as good as it gets i mean there's nothing to be won from going against him and saying I'm going to cut a couple days off your schedule and uh, I don't know. We don't really need that sequence over there. That's not going to work. 
So okay. do you do you kind of want to if it's someone like Francis Ford Coppola, you probably want to get him on like his first or second great movie and not on like his fourth or fifth? Well, there's a part of me that says yes, but the other part is on his fourth or fifth movie. If the guy's the biggest genius in the world, no one's going to want to stop him. So every everyone's going to be leaning in and saying, "Let's let this guy make what he wants to make." Right? At some point, you earn into people looking the other way. Mm -hmm. Until you don't, because. You know, I mean, the, the, the making films is a very simple thing to quantify. It, the films either are deeply award-winning movies or they make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And then everything in between is a little bit subjective. But, but either you have Academy Award-winning movies or very profitable movies and everything else is subjective. Have there been any, any aspiring directors that told you what they wanted to do and you kind of thought it was ridiculous and then they just blew you away? There have been shots that they've wanted to do that mm -hmm. I thought were ridiculous, and I was blown away. I would yeah. not say there's... Th there have not been a lot of directors who every day come to set and tell me what they want to do, and I roll my eyes, and I say, it's going to be a shit show, right. and then it's genius. That right. that doesn't happen. But, the, but listen, I c I'm wrong as much as anyone else, maybe even more mm -hmm. than other people, and I'm not a director, and I... And, and I personally am a visual person, so I am better at responding to, to something after I've seen it as right. opposed to hearing someone talk about it. There are different producers who are not that way. Yeah. yeah. So you, you, you were talking to us today that you got like a new project you're trying to get moving. And uh, we, we don't have to go into too much detail about it. Yeah. But what's that like? Is it? It seems like it happens fast. Sometimes it happens very fast. If you're competing for something. If like you're it. competing. But if you're not competing, it's the slowest, most arduous process trying to get a movie going. Like, like a, we'll come back to A Quiet Place because that's what's on the top of my mind, obviously. I mean, today is, uh, can I say what the day is? Did mm -hmm. we say that? So t today is Wednesday. People will be in theater seeing the movie tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. And it opens in earnest on Friday morning. You know, so... This is the last thing I will do before I get into bed and hide until Sunday. But this, and this is the biggest movie to have come out since COVID, like since this stage of COVID that we're in now, like post, you know, half X. Well, I don't know what that means because King Kong is a bigger oh, budgeted right. movie. Kong, but sorry. I would, but JT, I would say to I just you, got caught up in. I okay, wanted thank to, you, yeah. and I and I, but I had to correct you. But but the fact is, is this is the first theatrical movie. Like this movie is not on streaming anywhere mm -hmm. for a long time. So there is no, there's nothing to compare it to. But it seems somewhat fitting that we're the first one to come out because we were the last movie that was supposed to come out when this whole thing happened. This is so friggin' exciting. Yeah, that you can look at it that way. <laughs> um, you know, it's never easy for me to release a movie, especially when it's one that I, I, I feel in my heart and soul, it's a fantastic film. I'm mm -hmm. just excited for people to see this and um, the insecurity that goes with not knowing if people are going to like it or what they're going to do. You, as a producer, I'm always searching for something to give me a false sense of security. So... The movie is certified fresh. It's I think yeah. it's ninety two or ninety three percent. Okay, I can hold on to that for forty five minutes in a day, and then I'll think <laughs> right. about something else that makes me horribly insecure. Our theater is going to be open in this part of the country, and how, what's the capacity going to be? And suddenly, yeah. you know, the Rotten Tomato score goes out the head, out my head, and I'm worrying about something else. And have, have you guys adjusted your expectations based off yeah. those factors? Yes, but again. We, the answer is yes, but also normally when a movie comes out, there are three or four other movies that are coming out that weekend, right? There's one other movie that's coming out opposite us, but, but there is a long runway um, to have your movie stay in theaters, mm -hmm. which wasn't the case pre-COVID. There was always two or three blockbusters opening every weekend uh, for the, uh, and for Memorial day, which traditionally has been the, the start of the summer movie season. So the biggest movies of the summer always opened on Memorial day, just to have us. And there's uh, one other Disney film, um, you know, is a different situation. So there's no data that anyone can look at and say, yes, capacities have been released. I, I mean, reduced, but also you're in twice as many screens. So how does that, and, and no, yeah, no Top Gun or anything like that. No. that you're, 
I want Top Gun so bad. Competing interests yeah, with. Yeah. So, uh, do you, so do you talk to the studio and you're like, all right, guys, so here, and they're doing like tracking and they're like, hey, here's where we think is like a good number for us to open up at. Every friggin' morning. Every morning I'm on the phone with them. And, 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 but by the way, they're saying the same thing to me that I'm saying to you. We've all never been here. It looks good. People like the movie, the review, all the things I've said here, I'm just parroting what I heard this morning on my call with Paramount, mm-hmm. but no one knows. And then, so you assuage other people's concerns, right? Like if, if John's freaking out, you're like, Hey man, you did a great job. It's going to be great. You know what? I think it's different for John because John right now he's on tour going into theaters, surprising people around the country. That's cool. So, so he's getting feedback every night. On the movie. He is watching the movie with people. If I could go to a theater tonight and be assured that audiences are going to love this experience and that they're going... I mean, I feel very confident, but at the same time, until I, until I witness it, I think I talked to you the night that we first premiered The First Quiet Place in Austin, Texas, was the greatest night of my career because I could feel the audience pulling their chairs out. They were so excited. Just people going apeshit like that. I, f- I felt like, oh, wow, this is really a great experience until I have that experience. Because I haven't been able to, we haven't been able to test the movie with an audience in a real way because you right. can't do that now in, uh, up until two or three weeks ago. And by then it was too late anyway. So what's the point of doing it? So I have not seen this movie with an audience. The, I guarantee you no one has ever said what I'm about to say to you. I have never seen this movie with an audience with the exception I saw it with an audience once at the premiere, mm-hmm. which was a year and three months ago. We, did, we had you on you, right before that. Yeah. Did you guys have a premiere, a second one? No. Or, no? No reason to. Yeah. I mean, right. And you can't really do a premiere. I mean, you can do a right, premiere, yeah. but so many, you know, wh- why do it? I mean, they did it. They, they did a beautiful premiere in New York. Yeah. It was fantastic. But so you're, you're flying blind in war. Yeah. But you know, you got the goods in the plane. You know, you got the, I, I the do. good bombs. I do. I, you just I, I feel see like the that. target. I feel like that. I do. I feel like that. I'm telling you, JT, but... I mean, after being on the show for four times, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a neurotic guy, you know, this, this is, is the this most is nervous I've seen. You. Yeah. Well, this is because you've never been with me right before a movie comes I love out, it. like the day or I, I, the I'm day like, before. Yeah. I can, it's I can crazy. enjoy that. It is. But so who assuages you? Who like, who like, uh, who, um, who, who, who's like, tells you it's going to be all good. My GFF. Nice. Or do you have a routine in place to, to sort of, uh, you know, help, help quell Are your anxiety? Yeah. Right now. Hold on. In honor of A Quiet Place too. Oh, thank you. Get out there and see it, guys, and have a couple of fruit smashes beforehand. Yeah, I love fruit smashes. Then yeah. Uber to the theater. Yeah, exactly. Mmm. Delicious. What are you, what Come are you, on. What are you rocking? Delicious. Is that fruit punch? Um, this is a tropical punch. Tropical punch. punch. Nice. Because it's not too sweet, which is what I like about it. Yeah. You know, my brother said, my brother was with me last weekend, and he was, uh, he was drinking fruit smash, and he's like, the thing he loves about them is that he, he feels like he can't taste chemicals. Yeah. Like when you taste clean. other ones, yeah, it's, it's, it's real fruit. Yeah, it's clean. I like that. Yeah. That was very nice. Thank you. Um, <laughs> all right, what were you asking me? Uh, he, he was asking uh, me. Uh, is there a routine in place to like help quell your, you know, like well, eat y- soft boiled eggs no. <laughs> and wheat toast? No. Um, usually on a Friday night when the movie opens, I will not commit to doing anything. Yeah. But I will have someone who will drive me to the movie theaters mm-hmm. and I'll go with mrs fuller and paxton and cameron and we'll go and we'll walk around thank you and you know we'll walk around and i'll get that experience the visceral response that you get if a movie's working and if i feel that then i'll just keep going it's like a drug so we'll go you'll keep going i'll just keep going to other i'll go oh and this is like i'll say to alex and the kids i'll say Let's this theater because you start to see the times when the movie starts. So I'll say, well, this scene's coming up in that theater. Let's go there and see if that scare works. Or, yeah. or the, this in this theater, the movie just started. Let's see how that opening sequence works. And you kind of just go from theater to theater. It's it's right. super fun, super fun. Do you have to buy a ticket, or you just have a badge? That you know, I um, this? that's a funny thing because uh, I don't. I, I'm happy to buy a ticket. Uh, I'm happy to do that. But often Paramount will call and say. You know, th- th- these theaters in this part of town are very used to people who work on the movies going o- opening night. So yeah, Paramount cool. will call and say, uh, you might be coming by and, you know. Very cool. Do you, I, uh, well, I've been to the movies twice so far and yeah. it was it was packed last night. Really? Yeah. What did you see last Sunset night? Five. I saw Saw. 
Yeah, and I, I was it, on a date, and it was. Yeah. And, how was the date, by the way? Am I allowed to ask that? Okay. Yeah, it's good. good. I, yeah. I'm enjoying enjoying the single life. It's it's nice. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, can I ask one more question? Yes. Because I'm curious about this. Um, how do you meet a woman to date? Um, primarily dating apps these days. Right. See, uh, yeah. th- that that did not exist. Right. It was just. It was white knuckling it in a bar to go up and talk to a girl and hoping that she didn't throw a drink. At yeah, you. yeah. I, I kind of, I, I try to go for that approach more as much as I can in life. But I mean, it, especially during you know, it, I guess we're kind of in the post COVID era. It's a little, and I, you know, I'm I'm sort of like taking it easy a little bit, so I haven't really been going to bars and stuff. Um, so, but a lot of times, the the best ones are typically when you've sort of like have met in the past and then you kind of reconnect those seem to be the the most fruitful i guess but it seems to me and we don't have to go off on this we can talk about whatever you guys want but it does seem i'm 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 seeing this because some of my friends are getting divorced or what or or their status is changing right and social media becomes such an important thing like when you reveal the relationship on instagram is a major thing or what or what what you comment and if there's a heart or i I mean these nuances that are totally lost you right. know i i don't know any of this you um, pick it up quick though i know but it does feel like it's super complicated the yeah. what's big for me is looking at their story because yeah. you know they see when you look at it you know you can oh see is that it. true i didn't yeah. even know that yeah okay. you, you can see when you who's looking at your story if you look okay. at it right away like in the first minute you're yeah. sending a message like hey i'm paying see? attention yeah but who's writing that book like on what this is all this means see i but I, sometimes when i try to do it by a book I'm dead. I'm dead in the water. Why? Because I'm trying to game the system and the system. The only way through it is like instinct. I think you just subtly understand. You feel a switch go and you're like, oh, now is the time to say something. Because if you try to play it by like uh, a formula, it comes across. I think they can feel it. Everyone can feel it. Both sides. You you know, I think the key is is to have a lot going on. If If you're a busy guy, if you're doing a lot of stuff naturally you'll have that sort of energy about you right. that's not desperate or needy or right. you're kind of like this kind of like yeah i've got a lot of stuff going but i'd like to see you i think that's right that's key it's like mike in swingers where he keeps getting trying to get advice from vince vaughn and uh sue i forget that actor's name and then by the end of it when he meets heather graham he's like you know what guys i got it right right yeah well i hope i never find out <laughs> It how is how was the date? Is well, it was it a first date? No, this is like a it, number of like five or something. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, what yeah. what's it like for you when one of your friends is like in their late forties, early fifties, or something? And they get out of they get out of a long relationship and now they're back single. What's that like to to see? Well, there's parts of it that sound super interesting, right? And then there's other parts of it that I'm just like I'm exhausted even hearing about this. I it's just. You know, most of my friends have kids, so there's always like, when do you tell the kids, and what do you tell the kids, and when does she meet the kids, and there's that, and when does she meet my ex-wife, and it, and those are not new problems, but wow, it seems like that's just a lot to tackle, and then at the same time, figure out the social media thing, which I didn't yeah. grow up with, and my friends didn't grow up with, and they're all probably screwing it up and doing it wrong. Right. Do they turn into teenagers again yes, a little bit? Yes, they do, absolutely do, and they <laughs> fall in love so quickly, and it's like, <laughs> look from the outside looking in, it's like, don't you see what's happening? Right, here? right. But I guess you don't. And That makes me works. happy, though, that it's eternal. You know what I mean? Because I think in our heads, we're always like, oh, I'll grow out of this. It's like, no, as long as you're in that space, it's going to dredge up that stuff. I think we're all looking for love. I mean, I just feel like we are. And then then when you feel that thing, it's it's like a drug. It's like, you know, and so. Biggest drug in the world. When those feelings come in, it it overtakes you. It does. There's, yeah, there's one week where I was like, call my mom and so i was like what do i you know, when do i text <laughs> right Asking, that's the wrong person to I was, ask. I was like, yeah right actually my mom's good my mom's how very, does she know the rules because she's very like honest she's like she's like um because well she's more like I don't, I don't know i was like i was like when should i i was like i have this date set up a week from now and i set it up and i'm like should i text in between she's like she's like no i'd see that as desperate <laughs> so and like, she was right She's right. I, I, she's like, I, she's like, text her like on Thursday. So I did on Thursday, and that that worked. And it worked. Yeah. So, she she was she surprised me because I thought she'd be like, no, you should text her like just all the right. time, and, right. you know. But she was like, 
No, I'd see that as very needy and like this guy has no confidence. It's good. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I was, That's good. Yeah. I was watching Country Strong last night yeah. and Gwyneth Paltrow says this to Leighton Meester's character at the end and she's giving her advice on her career and she's like, hey, like always wear high heels, get your dresses hemmed here. Um, you know, always go with the best song, not with what you wrote. But her, her last line of advice is don't be afraid to fall in love. It's the only thing that matters in life. Wow. That's heavy. Yeah. Something to think about. But that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, but it's kind of, it I think it kind of takes the pressure off because then you're not worried so much about doing Once it. Once you get there. And you're not so worried about doing it right. You're like, oh, this is All just right. kind of part of it. I, that yeah. makes sense to me. It totally makes sense to me. The difference kind of is, is that you guys are able to, because you learn a lot about these people before you go out on a date with them because it's all whatever they want to put facing forward is all there right mm -hmm. it wasn't like that for me right? right you just met someone and you tr and then all of that peeling back the layers kind of happened over time right that, that's true that's too but people are they're able to dupe you with their because people know how to you know put their best foot forward on social media and then some people they can't help but be themselves and they right. start posting like crazy stuff and they got like 50 story updates and you're like for the day and you're like okay this person's a little intense but some people you look at their thing you're like oh this person's like the ideal human and then you you know get to know them and you're like oh, okay there's more to this right right I, it seems like a lot it does it seems like a lot well your yeah. boys are out there in the world right yeah of, it's of um love. yeah the, both of my cameron and paxton are out there they're definitely and dating. they're like good-looking, charismatic. That's you nice know. of you to say. They're, they're yeah. I, my wife and I would like to say they're good boys. You know, <laughs> you know those things, um, and they seem to be having a great time and having no issues with the things that we're talking about. But like, just yesterday, um, I called Paxton and I said, "You know, the movie's ninety-three percent fresh. Mm. I want to put that on my story." He goes, "You can't put that on your story." So why not? He goes, "It's douchey as hell. That's not what you put on your story. That, mm. I mean." You, you, you don't, please don't do that. That would embarrass the me. Trick, you got to re Paxton's got to post it and then you repost you his thing. Yeah. Right. But then, right. But then he's not going to do that because he doesn't want to draw attention. He, he, oh, right. He's, he's, he's being demure about it. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so now I'm just talking about it on the pod. Because I, I'm not I, gonna post. I, I, you I you guys need to post that. You I guys. Think, yeah. I'll post. I'll post sure. that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you guys. Thank uh, you. Uh, we're seeing it tomorrow. You got tickets for, yeah, through our agent. Where are you seeing it? Uh, Playa Vista, Cinemark. Is that is that a Q and A? Advanced, advanced screening. I don't is think there a it's Q and A. Q &A. It's just said advanced. We screening. got it through like uh, our agency. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Will okay, you text so me after? Yeah, oh yeah. So I'll text yeah. you. Not Promise. during. Not during. I'll, put, I'll, I'll also put. I, I I gotta disagree with Pax on this. One. I think you should post the ninety three. Uh, listen, we. Can, I, I, I wish you were here, but he had his own logic for it and whatever. Yeah. And so, I do, it, the, the kids tell me that I can't do a lot of things, and so I just yeah. end up not doing anything. <laughs> my, my dad, you know, he sold hair care, yeah. and he did a commercial for one of the hair care products. It was called Got To Be. And after I watched the commercial, I started crying, and I said, Dad, you cannot put this on TV. And what, and what happened? No, of course he put it out there. Oh, right. yeah. 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 He was like, look, we already made it, bro. Right, <laughs> like, right. There's no... It's too late. Yeah, it's too late ship, now. Sh ship sailed. No, so. and he liked it, too. He was like, I think it's cool. And right. then, you know, he, he knew more about it than I did. Right. Wait, so, so I was speaking to my dad. I always felt like he was like, like he always wanted me to, to, to get laid quite a bit. You know, not like it was Your like, dad did. I think so. Yeah. But also sometimes I think maybe I just projected that on to yeah. him. Yeah. But, uh, d is like, how did you handle, uh, sex in general, I guess, with your boys? Um, well, listen, it's, uh. I, I will start out by saying I think it's different between, with boys if you're the parent of boys versus girls, right? I right. think it's different. Um, but I, Ali and I always tried to present that there are two people consenting to something and that you want everyone to feel good about what's happening and, and um, you know, no hard feelings, right? That's, that's not the way you, you want to go about it. So it's always been in our house about respecting, you know, the women that they're spending time with and... Um, um, I've always been pretty open with the boys. I mean, is when they were much younger, um, I had a drawer. This is horrible, but here we go. Sorry, Paxton. I had a drawer in my bathroom that there was just always condoms in. You know, mm. it's like, and I didn't ask. I just said, that's there. So you never have to worry about where you're going to get it. It's always going to be stocked, you know, and, uh, and so, and I 
didn't count how many were in there. I just, when it got low, I would just load it back up. And what so, age when they got in high school? Yeah, definitely. Uh, toward, definitely not early high school, towards later. And, My dad made that drawer when I was in fifth grade, and I was like, the true? pressure. <laughs> I was like, I'm yeah, no, I, <laughs> I, was like, I would no, take no, it the other way and say, <laughs> like, you're depriving them the, the embarrassment of having to go to an Arco or something. Uh, right, but, but that, I thought about that, but, but they have Amazon, too, have, so, yeah. yeah. But, but, <laughs> oh, um, do they order on Amazon? Yeah, but yeah, oh, totally. yeah sure. Yeah. But the, the other part that's interesting about both boys is they are monogamous. Like, they mm. like to be in relationships. That's nice, yeah. For the most part, they do. Um, look, Cameron's calling me right now. It's nice. nice. Yeah. So, um, should we use the speakerphone and ask? No, we don't want to do that. <laughs> um, you know. So, but like, they're um, they're on the sites that you're on, I think, mm -hmm. and that's a, Pornhub. Yeah, they're on Pornhub, <laughs> looking for dates, and um, you know, they're out there. You know. It's, 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 LA is a great city for that, right? I mean, yeah. it, it's fun. It can be very fun. Especially now coming out of COVID, it's right. like everyone's going to be... Uh, going to see A Quiet Place 2 in theaters this weekend. For yeah. sure, on yeah. dates. Oh, yeah. On dates. That It's the perfect date movie. Oh, for sure. fantastic. Is, uh, yeah. is A Quiet Place 1 on a streaming service in case someone hasn't seen it? God, I should know that. I'm sure it is. I think you just have to Google it and yeah. it will tell you. I don't know where it... It feels like it's been Maybe everywhere. HBO Max or something? I don't know. Probably not like HBO Max. It's Paramount, Mo but I don't know. Oh yeah, that's right. I don't know. I don't yeah. know where it is, but it, it's Hulu. out there. I've seen it on Hulu. That's right. Yes. Yeah. I think you're right, Aaron. I think it's on Hulu. Um, so, do, do you feel better? I guess we'll we'll know more, you know, in like a week or two. But do you feel good that you guys like stayed the course and didn't do one of those like streaming deals? That's a loaded question. That really is because um, there. It's easy for me to say to you now. I'm glad we stayed the course. But you think back to the last time I was on the show, we didn't know when and if this thing was ending and if people would ever come out, right? I mean, right. before the vaccine, we didn't really know. And and there's there was a part of me that felt like, God, I really want people to see this movie. I really do. And if 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 the option is them not seeing it or seeing it on Netflix or HBO Max or a streaming service, I would rather them see it there mm -hmm. as opposed to not see it. So um, Paramount made a very bold move about 11 weeks ago where they picked this date. Fast and Furious was originally on this date and they punted uh, to um, a it's month like June Yeah, it, something. Yeah, I think they're a month later. Um, <clears throat> and it happened within a second. Like Paramount just pounced on the date. And when that happened... Who the, makes that call? It's everyone at Paramount and Viacom. I mean, it's a it's a big time call because there there was no one at that point. I remember when they made the call and people would say to me, what are they doing? You mm -hmm. know, the vaccine just came out or people are just getting the vaccine. How are people going to go see movies 10 or 11 weeks from now? And at the time, that created a whole different level of anxiety for me because of what if... You know, what if what is happening now wasn't happening? What would we do? We would have lost the opportunity with this movie. Are they contacting people at the CDC? I, I think they have people everywhere that, I don't know if it's CDC, but they are talking. They, they're not just Are they talking like Newsom too? I, you know, or, I don't or, know. I, in, I don't know if it if it gets, I think it's more on a national level than, as opposed to a local level. Um, but it was, a, it was a ballsy, ballsy call. And if it works out, I will be eternally grateful that they took the chance that you know because yeah. it is a big chance to take and 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 this movie specifically is a must see in theater type of movie it is yeah. it definitely is i mean we we built it that way and you know sound was such an important part of the first one right um that this is you know this one it's even more so mm -hmm. yeah so can i ask kind of an old man question i'm an old man so i'm gonna be the right guy to ask so um I was thinking about, it doesn't seem like there's like a ton of young, great actors and actresses. And maybe that's just like my, uh, you know, like you always think when you were growing up, there was like a, it's like whatever Saturday Night Live you grew up with, you think was the best or something like that. Right. But I can only really think of like Timothy Chalamet, I guess, as like a, like a young budding male lead who can, is exciting to people. Do you think like... Is it tough to cast those parts right now? Because so much of that energy has gone into these like uh, social media platforms? You know, I don't know if it's hard because it's gone into social media platforms. I think that stars are made differently now. So like um, Joey King, right? Do you know who Joey King mm -hmm. is? Mm -hmm. So a fantastic actress. Um, she did, you know, a movie. I, I, 
I think it was on Netflix called The Kissing Booth, right? Mm-hmm. And she's been working her whole life. She's a young actress. She's been working her whole life. But The Kissing Booth came on, and she became a huge star. And na- and now she just wrapped a movie with Brad Pitt. So she's in. She's doing the Dave Leach movie with Brad Pitt. Uh, train the train. Whatever. Do you know anyone know what it? Is? It's the, they just wrapped it. It's a Sony movie, I think. And you know, so um, I think that producers are finding actors in different places, right? Right, like. It felt like in the old days they were either they would either see them on a TV show. I mean, Brad Pitt did guest spots on, you know, all those. That movie eight. across the tracks with Ricky Schroeder. Yeah, exactly, did. exactly. That's what I was referencing. <laughs> Nobody was like on one, you know, those sitcoms. He, he did some guest spots on that. Now it's a little bit different. They come from different places. I guess some do come from social media. I don't. I don't. Like I've that's what I'm wondering. Can those people make the leap? I think anyone can make the leap. I don't think that. The, yeah, Mark Wahlberg did it. He was like an underwear model and yeah, rapper. And he's a great actor. So yeah, I mean, anyone who's talented can make the leap. They just have to get seen, hmm. right? And and they have to get the opportunity. Well, what do so. you think of TikTok? I remember last time we talked, you were you were, Cameron was, telling you that you need to get more into the TikTok yeah. world. How, how are you feeling about it these days? Um, you know, Cameron has pushed me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've, you know, a couple of those big TikTokers have reached out to me and one or two of them I'm working with now to see if there's something I can do with them. I mean, I find TikTok absolutely hypnotizing. Like I can start watching t- TikTok and an hour later I will not. I, right. Like there is nothing in my life that turns on my brain quicker than TikTok. Yeah, the user experience is so nice. How does that happen? It's like crack. It's yeah. deep in your brain. It's it just is. funneling down just. Hits. You know, and like if I'm Hits. bored, I just you know, it just you know, but but clearly they're reaching a ton of people, and you know, for the first time in terms of marketing a movie, our trailer was on TikTok. John did a live TikTok. I mean, really, that's a thing. That yeah. that's just a different place to reach a lot of people. Do you Does see- it scare you at all? That 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 form of entertainment these days is sort of taking over a little bit. No, I I, I mean, I think that there's plenty of room for people to be entertained because they're carrying around their screens with them everywhere they go. Right. Right. Um, but I think that there, and maybe I'm deluding myself, but I think that there are, the movie going experience is a unique one. Mm-hmm. And for movies that uh, you have to see in a theater, there's nothing that kind of compares to that. Yeah. And, and, and being in the movie, going back to the movies, I mean, it's, I was like on a, it, it was euphoric being right. back in the movie theaters. Cause it, it, you can't, you know, especially when you're looking at, you know, your TV, your phone all year. And then being back and, you know, you have popcorn. And all it's immersive. Stuff. And it's, it's an immersive. immersive yeah, yeah. So so I, I think that TikTok, TikTok is additive. Instagram is additive. The thing that I, that I wonder is that for most of my career, if you wanted to learn about movies, you would, or if you wanted to market your movie, you would buy an ad on a sitcom, mm-hmm. right? And now I don't know how you reach. So many people are watching things on Netflix and, and and on Apple TV, and there's no commercials. So the question kind of is, how do how do we as content providers reach our audiences? And and TikTok offers that, but is TV a viable option now? Like, do you guys watch any network television shows? I'm curious. No, no. I, I've been meaning to watch Home Economics just because our buddy Jimmy Tatro's on there. That's nice. That's uh. Is that Topher yeah. Grace? Topher mm-hmm. Grace, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's great. Yeah. Do you watch any network TV? No, it's all streaming. Now, ten years ago, this conversation would have been very different, right? Do you, ten years ago, I cut the cord, but yeah, ten years, wow, yeah, I, I was early on. Yeah, you, I, I, <laughs> I think was really mad at DVR once. You should be doing TikTok. <laughs> And I think Not me. you want to do one today. Should I think we dance? Pers- and we have one, Randy, thirty-year-olds, where we, we get shirtless and dance on there. Yeah. And I'd love to do one of those to yeah. promote a quiet place. I, I'd love to watch you guys. We'll do call that. this a loud place one. <laughs> okay, yeah. I like that. You guys should a shirtless. Place. Thank you. I'd love that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, the it, the landscape is changing, and it's a little scary because everyone who is making the decisions or who is making the movies, my peers. We're all people who are not raised on any of this stuff. So it's, it, you know, we're trying to adapt looking backwards and forwards at the same time. And I think right. that, you know, I don't want to miss an opportunity, right? Yeah. Like, I should have made a TikTok with you guys for the movie. We should I, we should have done that. <laughs> right. That probably would have driven huge sales. Yeah. Oh, maybe. 
Oh, for sure. Still can, guys. Well, we'll definitely do it. Okay, good. <laughs> shirtless. Good. <laughs> you have to be shirtless, though, bro. <laughs> not happening, dude. No one wants to. Dude, that. you're Brad shredded. Like, you know you're shredded, no, Brad. Brad, thank you no, so much on. for making that shirtless TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> it's not happening. We'll figure it out. Well, maybe <laughs> wife beaters. <laughs> um, <laughs> what did you think about Amazon buying MGM for $8.8 billion? It's wow. amazing. I think it's amazing because... And what does MGM have their biggest thing as Bond? Yeah. yeah, they have Bond, but also they have huge library. I mean, MGM has, you know, going back all the musicals from the 30s and 40s and 50s. Weren't Marvel and Pixar like $5 billion or Mar- something? Uh, yeah, but... Star, well, Star Wars was four. Yeah, but then you okay. got to think about the TV, too. I mean, MGM has... Yeah. Um, Just the size of their library is so much bigger oh than those God. other guys. And, yeah, and like Shark Tank is an MGM show, right? Mm. I mean... That show is so good. That's a huge piece of business, Shark Tank. Just, yeah. just that, right? Yeah. And they have they have a lot of television. Mark Burnett is a genius, obviously, and so, um, you know, it just speaks to the value of content. I mean, everyone looks at these things that are happening through their own rose-colored glasses. I look at it that content is so valuable that they're paying eight point five billion dollars to own that library, right? So, that's good. And the, and and by the way. I think a lot of the movies that MGM made, this will give them an opportunity to really be seen in a different way, you know, because Amazon, as you know, we have Jack Ryan on there. They are, if they are behind something, it's incredible mm. how they market and reach their audience. And yeah, because they're so data driven, they can yeah, like, I don't know how they do it, but I can tell you that when Jack Ryan, the first season came on, uh, every single box that came to my house for two months had John Krasinski's face on it. And it said Jack Ryan on Amazon Prime. Whoa. No, the movie uh, movies haven't been marketed that way before, right? You know, and then if you went on, if you wanted to buy a Tom Clancy title, not a Jack Ryan title, any Tom Clancy title, John's face was on the cover of the book. Really? Yeah. So, wow. Like their marketing reach is unique and different, and I think it's great because more and more people will get to see things that maybe they wouldn't have known existed or didn't care to see or they just didn't get reached in the right way mm-hmm. uh, i want to ask you too about uh so john cena yeah got in trouble because he was yeah was he speaking in mandarin i in think he was speaking in mandarin uh, i feel yeah, so I badly i feel texting me about it i feel so badly for him i i mean he seen i've never met him he seems like the nicest guy in the world mm-hmm. and like all most, he wants um, the most make-a-wish visits ever is like that true person. cena yes yeah, he beat the rock yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. He seems like just like the greatest guy. But to, to catch people up, he, he was doing an interview in Mandarin promoting the Fast and Furious, and he referred to Taiwan as an independent country, which goes against the communist, the, the Chinese Communist Party. And typically when people make mistakes like that, it like craters the sales of whatever thing they're promoting in China. Yeah. So like it could be like a like a hundred million dollar gaff. gaff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, ugh, it's so unthinkable. I, you know, I had someone call me today who said the actors know not to do what he did if if the movie's opening in China. You know, I, yes, we're all aware of that. Yes, because it's such a. I don't want to minimize what he did or didn't do. It's just such a. There was no malice in this. Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? It was. I mean, he was trying to do the interview in right, Mandarin. It was just an honest mistake. You know, and, and that, well, yeah, it wasn't the, like just, free Taiwan. No, <laughs> yeah, like, no. Right? But then, and they're furious. Yeah, over it. They're, they're fast and furious. <laughs> they, <laughs> oh, <dude. laughs> they do like they'll start doing like uh, propaganda right away. Really, like saying screw this guy and like screw this. Really, it'll cost. I think it's cost people like wow. four hundred million dollars before for like. Wow. But uh, so what would you recommend? Let's say Chad and I, by some grace of God, are in Fast and Furious like eleven. But if you want to be in Fast 11, my my friend Neil Moritz produces those movies. I might be able to, you know, at least get you guys an audition for I, sure. I mean, I, could, sure. I have a driving tape I could submit to him. Really? Yeah. Me and I'll my get truck. it to Neil. I will yeah. get that to Neil. I, I, I want me doing a burnout, and then I give a pretty, like, pretty cool look. Oh, to the really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Did, no, I'll get it to him. Neil must have had no... I mean, the first Fast and Furious is like a small movie relative to what they've become, at least. Yeah, yeah. And it uh, wasn't like a gigantic blockbuster. Well, it was really successful. It was, but but yes. I mean, in the build up to it, like they yes. didn't know it was going to be like no, no one knew. So does what does like Neil think now when he's like on this like rocket ship, basically? Well, you know, I I would say that Neil's been on a rocket ship 
for much of his career. I mean, forget forget Fast and Furious. I mean, he's made so many successful films. I mean, Sonic and Twenty One Jump Street and Twenty Two Jump Street, and uh, you know, he did Triple X. I mean, Neil rarely gets it wrong, mm. right? Um, but Fast and Furious was the first really big one that he did on his own, and. Listen, he he loves that franchise more than you can imagine, and he yeah. uh, you know, and you know he has it's such a fun franchise to be a part of because it's just cool as shit. Yeah, like everything about it's really cool. Like the cars yeah. are cool and people are cool, and obviously we can get to Paul if we want to get there. But yeah. you know, like he you know that's just like what a dream to have a movie there that they're going to make. 10, 11, 12, 15, who knows how many of these they can make. Mm -hmm. But it's en it feels like it's endless. It will never stop. Yeah, I, I agree. Would you, so do you... I hope it doesn't. Are, are we happy that The Rock's out and now it's back to just being Vin? You know, I've, Neil and I have not discussed that. I know he had a great experience with The Rock, and I, you know, he and Vin have been working together forever. So, um, It wasn't big enough for the two of them, though. Is that true, though? I don't know that that's true. You know, Dwayne just is... He's super busy. Like, it, lining up the other actors who've been in the franchise for a long time, um, that's a scheduling nightmare, right? And then, and, and Dwayne is probably the hardest working actor now. I mean, he just never stops. And he has Hobbs and Shaw. Yeah. So. But that's but that's what I'm saying. What What are you saying? Oh, you, what you're insinuating is that they, now they have two different franchises because it, it. Yeah, was they're just, like, we'll give you Hobbs and Shaw. You get to keep the Fast and Furious. I never heard any discussion. Yeah. But I think I I see that as an underdog W for Vin because even though he's the original guy, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and, and he has more uh, claim to it. Yeah. The Rock is the biggest movie star in the world. Right. So I could have just as easily seen everybody go with The Rock and then kick Vin out of the franchise. No, no. Okay. Vin is <laughs> integral to. So that we're thing. saying that's what I'm saying is Vin. Vin's the most integral. Yes, I would say that Vin is the most interesting because he was there from the very beginning. Can you imagine if they're like, The Rock is Dominic Toretto? They just straight up replaced <laughs> like his family. Replaced. Be a little more <laughs> believable in the fight scenes, I think. Oh, right, right, yeah. Yeah, but wow, what a great thing to have it's, been it's a incredible. part of in a career. I mean, yeah. just amazing. I, I remember when Fast and Furious 4 came out, I lost my mind. Like, like 2009, uh, I think it was 2009. Because Tokyo Drift came out, and I was like, and I was like, okay, the, you know, the dream is dead. And then that came out. I was in Spain at the time. I I, I don't know. I, I think that was the most excited I've ever been for a movie. Was, really? Yeah, I was like, no way. Like, Paul's back, Vin's back. Like right. that. That was that was a really smart move by them too. Yeah. Yeah. That's what Fast Five was for me. Fast Five. That's when I was yeah. like, yeah, I saw that at like a bang in theater, like on like 97th and Third or something like that in yeah. New York, and the theater just went off yeah it was like it was one of the best theater going experiences of my life yeah you know what i think i'm gonna do um because neil does listen whenever i do these oh, i'm really? not gonna tell him yeah. that we talked about him at all i'm cool. just gonna say you should listen to it yeah and I just send it to him and then yeah i think that's i think that's is that the better way to go about it you think i should tell him I don't know. Yeah, that'd be a surprise. Yeah, yeah I, I like the surprise. Ju yeah. Justin Lin's another director like that where he did Better Luck Tomorrow. It's like yeah. this super sad but Orange County based mm -hmm. movie. And, you know, it's really, like, uh, dramatic. Yeah. And then he somehow he can do the Fast and Furious movies. Again, just because... you got to look at it this way, JT. People start with small movies because no one's giving them any money. Right. Mm -hmm. Then they make their small movie, and if it's excellent, everyone comes to the conclusion, hey, this person's super talented. Let's give them and see. Let's give them some money and see what they can do, mm. right? I, yeah, I guess it's just like the, the the big '90s directors. A lot of them came from like music videos and yeah. commercials and yeah. stuff. Yeah. And then once their first movie hit, their second or third movie was just a bigger budget version of that. It's like right. okay, like Wes Anderson, you did Rushmore. Now you're going to do Royal Tenenbaums, right. but you can see like a very direct line in the sensibility. Whereas now it's like, all right, Wes Anderson, you did Rushmore. Now you're doing Jurassic Park, the the deck, right? Like the tenth one. <laughs> well, that that's def that definitely happens, and some people rise to the occasion, and those are the big franchise directors, and some of them come back and do smaller movies. I mean, it just you never know, and there's so many other variables that it can't rest squarely on the shoulders of of the director, right? There's other things, and timing, and proper casting, and you know, there's so many different variables, but but the ones that consistently hit the hit it out of the park are the ones that. You know, who heck the biggest movies because it's the biggest risk. Yeah. For sure. 
Did I say for sure there? No, I didn't. I thought, I, 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 it, that I took was a my version of you saying for sure. I took a second. I was like, thank you. You looked yeah. at me like I said it. And yeah. then I was like, did I say it? <laughs> yeah. That was incredible. So, thank you. Yeah, I've been like, working on that. You had good tone on that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, what was I going to ask? Let's talk about um, that on July 2nd, the Forever Purge opens. Oh, oh yeah. yeah I, I mean, we still have that to cover, right? Yeah. Who's the lead? Uh, Josh Lucas. Oh, I oh, love cool. Josh Lucas. Yeah, he's great. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of people, but I, I, I did a pilot with Josh a long, long time ago. I loved working with him. He's a fantastic guy. But there's a lot of people in that movie. I don't even want to give too much of the, the cast away, but... Um, Grillo? Gr- Grillo's not in that one. Damn it. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting because I was talking to James DeMonico this morning about, about it, and we were just talking about the fact that people just love that idea and for james it came from such a dark place where he was in a sears Mm -hmm. james lives in uh, staten island and he's in a sears and someone was just taking so long in the line and kept asking questions and he just said to his wife i swear to god i wish there was a day where you could just kill whoever you want (laughs) and that that born out a franchise like just out of that idea and i think one of the great things about um, great concepts is they're so they're so obvious. Like a great concept is so obvious in the fact that yeah. you know James kind of came up with that and just you know executed the way he did, and now we got you know forever perch. Well, that that I think we talked about this before, but that just the the premise of the movie just grabs you right away. Because I mean it, that's something that I think everyone's sort of fantasized about, right? And thought about, and and then to have a movie about that is just so. Uh, I remember when I first heard about. It, I, I saw that in theaters. The first one I've seen. I think all of them in theaters. But um, uh, what's the premise of this one? If you can get into some detail. Wow. Now Universal hasn't given me my list of things I can and can't talk about. But basically, I'm just going to tell you what it, it is. It's Taiwan. like what's that? It takes place in Taiwan. <laughs> it does not take place in Taiwan. Um, you know, we're used to hearing that purge siren. Right. And that's when everything stops. But what if it doesn't stop then? What if people just keep purging? Hmm. Once they purge, they can't stop they kind of thing. They can't stop. They just, they, they ignore the, uh, yeah. which kind of mirrors where we're at now, where it doesn't feel like there's as much like uh, uh, high trust in like institutions. For and sure. so yeah. I, I could see us being in a place where, you know, we don't have the capacity to stop something like that. So that's, that's the concept of this movie. And, uh, you know, really super fun and that's a you know that's something that i hope you know we get to keep on making those because those yeah. movies are really you know they, they hit the zeitgeist yeah. and i think that if, if 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 i meet people and they ask me what movies i've made that's the one that people seem to really connect with mm-hmm. on it you know that concept you know fucked up people not normal people but yeah yeah did, did you, you you're kind of like a uh expert in like horror and in action like would you say or would you say it's across the board no 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 i would not say it's it's definitely not across the board i mean i've made a lot of horror movies so i know a little bit about that so you really respect genre like you really respect genre expertise i do absolutely and then but you're a light guy so what kind of do you think gave you the uh ability to be able to break down horror so well well i'd say in the beginning i just uh i just wanted to make a good movie and um and and the script that we had on te- the first movie I made, uh, you know, at Platinum Dunes was Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and the script was just so good and so scary, and it felt like at that time that was two thousand and one, um, that horror movies were pretty crappy and they didn't look good, they really didn't look good. There was you know it was kind of like you make big action movies or you make a romantic comedy, and horror was like the redheaded stepchild of all that and Mm -hmm. you know and when bay and i would be sitting around and talking about it he'd say well why don't we make like a great looking horror movie like a really rich great looking horror movie that's just super visceral and scarier than what people are used to Mm -hmm. and that's how texas chainsaw kind of came into existence and uh i i would say um that the movie itself when you watch that movie, you can smell how stinky that house is, right? Or you can, like, like you really get, like, Marcus Nispel, who directed it, did, did such a great job that you can really feel what it would be like to live in that house. And I think that's why that movie was so scary for so many people, is that it, 
it felt so visceral and tangible, like right there. And, uh, and that was a great experience. And so once you do one thing well, Hollywood says, well, you, that's your thing. Yeah. So we just kept riding that wave. Is there, uh, when you're reading a script, um, is there, do you, do you feel it sort of in your gut or whatever when you're reading a script? They sort of like, okay, I think this is something I want to do. Or do you do you take time to process it? What I feel is um, I feel that um, a concept, I can get excited about a concept. Right. Um, I'm not great at recognizing characters necessarily. Um, like I, I, I won't give the note, this character, we have to change these little things. I can do big moves I'm good at. Mm-hmm. Um but I think that the, that the where I've been lucky is that recognizing that audiences will respond to this, whatever mm-hmm. this is. And I haven't always been right, but um, I've been right more than I've been wrong. Right. And so um, that's what people present to me because um, everyone wants to get their movie made, you know. And so I'm always on the lookout for, you know, new concepts and, you know, trying to find you know, something that is as good as The Purge or, yeah. or Quiet Place, because those are both just magnificent concepts yeah. to, at the beginning, you know, there, to start out. It feels like there's fads in horror, too. Like, uh, you know, there was, like, the, the torture porn kind of yeah. era with Saw and Hostel, and and those were, like, uh, kind of heavily predicated on, like, Viscera. Yes. So would you give notes? You'd be like, hey, like, people are responding to this right now. Like, House of Wax or whatever. I remember when I saw that. They, they, there was so much creativity in terms of just how they dismember the people. Right. And that was kind of what was drawing people to theaters at that time. At least it seemed like that. So, but that can go wrong, too, because um, the first Chainsaw um, was certainly violent. Um, but we did a sequel called uh, Texas Chainsaw The Beginning. And that went way too far. And that was in response to Saw. And, mm. um, you know, I think that, like... We saw Saw, and that was really brutal. I mean, you know, and everyone then, talked about that. The the the, yeah. the scene at the end where yeah. Els takes his own leg. That's everyone crazy. talked about. That. I never even watched it. And Hostel yeah, too. I, I mean, like Eli's movie. It. You know, these movies are, they they were really scary, but they really presented violence in a way that we hadn't seen it before. So we just all looked at each other. I said, Well, if we're gonna make another Texas Chainsaw, we got to make it worse than that. And <laughs> like that movie opens with a poor woman having a very bloody birth in a slaughterhouse, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there is nothing that could be more disgusting than that. I mean, it is so bad. And we show every part of the birth. And yeah, that yeah. is the birth of Leatherface. And it's disgusting. That's, birth, that's pretty like, hilarious, though, yeah. for it to be the birth of Leatherface. I, know. I like that. And, and, yeah. we're, and we're all, we're sitting around and we're saying, the director, great guy named Jonathan Liebsman, we're sitting around and we're like, how can we make this more disgusting and more, yeah. you know, and then, and then we had a scene towards the end of the movie where... Leatherface literally peels Matt Bomer's face off. <laughs> yeah. And when we shot that, I didn't even want to look at the monitor. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like I didn't even want that image in my head because I could I knew I could never get rid of it. And so yeah. so like we were responding to what was happening around us. Like yeah. it, it was, and I think after that movie, I kind of at least for me personally, I just said, you know, I'm going to put the pump the brakes a little bit. I think for me, I'm just not comfortable with all of that disgustingness. It's just too much for me to deal with and yeah you were outside your taste a little bit way outside my <laughs> taste i mean but i mean i almost want you guys to watch the beginning of texas chains at the beginning so you can just see this disgusting birth in this disgusting oh i i, I i'm sure we we could have made it worse if we had rats running in the blood as the baby was coming up but we and, yeah. looking yeah. it up and what did they did you guys test that scene and did it test like too graphic for I audiences think, i think i don't remember because it was in 2005 so that you know 16 years ago i don't remember um i remember testing that movie was not a fun experience that audiences were not responding the way they did to texas chainsaw the first one i mean right. I, I, and i think we all felt like you know maybe we 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 kind of maybe we went too far and how are we going to pull this back but but that's not what was happening at the time at the time everyone was going for it so you go for it and yeah did you guys adjust based off the we really i don't remember adjusting that much i've i remember thinking well the prevailing 
attitude about violence is this so we're going to give people what they're expecting yeah do you, you get MPAA, do you get some the mpaa wasn't coming down on we did have to we had we, there there were some things in there i remember that we had to shave frames like it wasn't like yeah. they didn't say you can't do the sequence but we said like you know the, there's too much blood or there's too too much of this well, i'm just saying that's what's crazy it's like the mpaa was allowing all oh this my violence God. and gore and stuff it's right but like, if yeah. you show like a vagina it's nc-17 yeah, but if you right, show language, like guys like face getting dismembered from the mandible it's everyone's are. like hey it's pg baby Let it ride. <laughs> yeah but like Bring i wouldn't kids. make a movie like that now <laughs> i'm not interested i, I just yeah. don't it just feels gross yeah Do, it seems like nowadays too audiences and i don't really know but it seems like audiences are more interested in movies sort of like quiet place or, or purge that sort of make your imagination run wild a little bit more but like the strong purge concepts it's strong concept but where the these, purge yeah. is pretty violent i mean that too yeah. it is pretty violent and uh you know i mean this next one is a little i mean they're all violent but but not like the stuff you're talking about but i the violence in the purge is become part of the dna of that franchise and so we can't make a pg-13 version of the purge right. the, the fans would not embrace that i can't imagine but um you know one of the things i was very proud of was a Quiet Place was a movie that didn't rely on any blood. There was not, yeah. you know, there was no blood in that. And I don't think there's any blood in the second one either. Um, you know, we, we relied more on the tension and the scares. And, and, yeah. and there was it, a birth in the first one, though, right? Yes. <laughs> it, I think you're right, though, too. That's right. You're right. I've done two births. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when, when I think about those movies, I don't think about any of the violence. Yeah. Or, or even, I, I don't even think about the scenes as much. I just think about the concept. Yeah. 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 And the like, Purge is really strong for that. Like, you don't have to see anything. Just having that, those scenarios, it's like, yeah. wow. Like a, a gang chasing down some like innocent person that like just yeah. immediately yeah. puts you into like a tension. Well, yeah. the siren, it just sirens and noises with that one. You hear gunshots going off and you're just, your imagination, yeah. you just. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing about The Forever Purge um, is that some of the movie takes place in the day. Mm -hmm. And scaring creating a scare in the day is a much more challenging thing than creating one at night. And we have a sequence, we have a very, I think we have a very scary sequence in the day. And I think that's a, 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 that is a much harder and smaller target to hit if you're doing it in the day. That's why, right. you know, most of them take place at, I mean, that's why they all, you know, take place at nights. Most horror yeah. movies do. But, I mean, nighttime, when you're a kid too, you're not afraid of the day. It's no. Like once the lights go off and then you don't know what's out there, yeah. that's when it starts to go. Yeah. Do, do you feel like, um, Working in such like a, like a gruesome material sometimes, do you think that gets some of that energy out of you? Like, do you think that makes you lighter overall? You're like, you get some kind of catharsis from uh, the gnarliness? Um, I think this is the first time someone said catharsis and gnarliness yeah, back to back. I, I think that's <laughs> well, certainly in my life. Um, I, I do, I do. You know, like it's, I don't, as I've said, I don't love it, but there is some catharsis in doing that and, um, I don't know that I like that feeling anymore. I feel like I've kind of changed a little bit. Oh, like I've done it. Like I, th you know, we did a. We you're like a hitman who like. <laughs> yeah. you're like I don't. I don't get to say. Yeah, yeah. I don't. It, yeah, it doesn't turn me on the same way. But like, one of my, I think my favorite movie that I made, and it's a super violent movie, and I love the movie. Was our Friday the Thirteenth? Not. It wasn't called our Friday the Thirteenth. There have been many Friday the Thirteenths, and then we made one in um, I think 2009, 2010 with Jared Padalecki in the lead and and it I love that movie. I and it's super violent um but it's super fun and I liked the balance, right? If there's balance in it and it's not just all killing people and just depressing that I can handle more violence. Do, do mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? But if it's just pure violence I, I don't think I can do that. Yeah. It's it's funny too because the audience for those films sometimes that is what they want is like the mm -hmm. like my friend Greg is kind of like a horror cinephile. I mean he's a cinephile in general, but he knows everything about horror. And when he was younger, I don't even know if this would still be his opinion, but like I like Joyride a lot, the Paul Walker yeah, movie. Great movie. I thought it was really cool, but it's super tension based. And yeah. I remember being like, we both liked him when we came out of the theater, and then he went home and like read more, and um, and then I was like, uh, I was like, oh, dude, Joyride was dope, and then he's like, not a high enough body count. Right, and that was like right. the consensus on like Joe Blow, the website he would go right. to, like on the message boards. Yeah, well, well, Joe Blow is a great website, but that you know that that is a certain fan group, right? Who I very familiar with because I loved being on that site when we were making all those movies. Uh, Bloody disgusting is another one where where you know they're very focused on that. Um, 
and you're doing movies that like like Friday the Thirteenth or like uh, or Texas Chainsaw that have like a huge uh, legacy in horror. So it's like they're gonna come at For sure. you, yes, they, like that, that's quadruple. Right. That's right. And so you have to you have to play by the rules that were set up before we got involved, right? And so the rules are that they have to be this certain violent thing. Um, but I feel like now there's you know there's different people who can make those movies, and I'd like to try and. See if there's other ways you can scare people. You know, oh, you nice. know, just it just not. I, it, for me, it started to feel like violence was becoming a crutch. Right. Super violence was becoming a crutch, and I just thought I've done that a lot. Maybe there's something else I can do. Maybe there's one about a ghost crossing the street. Yeah. You could base it at my place. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, we should all make a movie together. Yeah. Let's I'd go. love that. I'd love that. That'd I'd be, love that. That'd be so fun. Yeah, it would be. Fun. I like that idea, a different way to scare people. That's such yeah. an interesting kind of a, a way into it. But yeah. if you if you actually can do that, can you, you know, like audiences would love that, right? Yeah. You know, the timing, the cadence, the cutting pattern. Audiences are familiar. They know what's going to happen. I think that it's my job as a producer to give audiences, when they think the right hook is coming, to give them an uppercut. Do you yeah, know what I'm saying? Right. Mm-hmm. The other side. And that's a really great movie going experience. I always want to surprise people. You know, it's one of the scariest scenes I've ever seen in a movie is this independent film, Terry. with the, It's with John C. Riley, and it's about a high school kid. But there's a slumber party with like these two nerdy guys and a popular girl. And just not knowing what was going to happen between those three as they're kind of getting over their skis with like, uh, kind of like sexual games or something like that. I was terrified. Right. Like terrified. But that, that's a, I'm going to ask you. And it's a leading question. But doesn't that feel like a richer experience than watching someone cut someone's head off? I think I think because of what you're saying, because it was, I mean, it was one thing because it was like, part of what scared me about it was it felt so real. So that was what was really right. scary. But then the other part that freaked me out was like, I did not see it coming in this film at right. all. But this was like a coming of age story. And like, you knew this kid was getting bullied and stuff. So you were sensitive to it. But you didn't see this moment coming. And the whole movie kind of builds to that unexpectedly well, to that. Right. Moment. Well, well, what you're talking about is kind of like, did you see Hereditary? No, but I heard it's amazing. Did you see it? Mm-hmm. That sequence that happens in the first 15 minutes of the movie, I don't want to talk, I, I mean, I don't want to give it away, is the scariest sequence that I've ever seen. Yeah. Where, you, where, where something happens that you just can't believe what's happening, and the tension is it's so masterfully done. Mm-hmm. So you have to see that movie. I gotta watch it. I know I'm not you a. Have I'm, to I'm, watch I'm really horror movies. I, oh, okay. I had to see a therapist when I was a kid because my nightmares okay. were so brutal. But I am 33 now. I think but you, I do live by myself. But do you agree? Do you agree about that? Yeah, it, it was that that, and I watched that alone on Halloween. Um, it 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 sort of blows your mind because it, it, the way he shot it, and it makes you sort of question what you saw. Right. And you and you're sort of like. But it, isn't that taking horror to the next level? Of course, yeah. And right. It's, like, it, that's it's, what excites me. Something like that. Yeah, I deposit. And watch it the rest during the day. Right. So After that scared. sequence? Yeah. Well, now you're going to have Or the to Uncut this. Gems guy. They did a good yes. job, which is, that was more tension. But yeah, but I like that. Right. Sustaining that feeling. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you want to go to the movies to have an emotional experience um, that stays with you. I'm very, when I see a scary movie, I, I really like watching scary movies in the theater because I'm very, like, kind of an active watcher. Like, my legs come up when I get scared. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's. <laughs> If I'm on a date, I'm just like I'm like they're like still and they're they're like handling it. And I'm just like ah, <laughs> but it's all it's so much fun. That's why but you're I, the I, more fun person to sit with in an audience for oh, a horror yeah. movie. Oh that's, yeah, that's 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 what I love. I'm having like, a good I'll, time. I'll be at the last row looking for someone with their legs coming up. Like yeah. that's super fun. I I'm, love I'm it. having a great time. That's good. It's right, fun. right. Yeah. It enhances the experience. Yeah, because well, yeah, I just love that. It, it, it yeah, it just. I'm just curious. Does that happen when you watch them at home? Uh, not as much, but See, I do, right. you know, I do, I, I do sort of get very kind of, I react a lot. Right. But I, I love it. it. The whole experience is so much fun. Cool. I remember when I saw The Conjuring. Yeah. Great movie. <laughs> Great movie. I, um, I, yeah, I love to get a big popcorn, big soda. And my buddy had seen it already. And he, so he knew some of the scary points. And he like he extra scared me during the one. Thing I, was, I was like, ah! And the popcorn flies up, the soda flies up, and just like slams down the ground. That's awesome. And right at the beginning of the movie, you just you just hear it all, just sort of like dripping down. But that's, ground. I yeah. love that. It, yeah, that's it was, what I want to see. It's very memorable. Yeah, I'll for never sure. forget. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you want to answer some questions? Of course. 
Okay, so this dude reached out to me on IG, and uh, we chatted a little bit on there. And but he was he was he really wanted us to answer it on the pod because mm-hmm. any because he said he, there's more context in here as well. So he said, "What's up, Stoke Lords? For the past two weeks, my emotions have been tortured and mangled, and I really don't know what to do. Essentially, my girlfriend boned one of my homies hours after we broke up. To back it up, me and my girlfriend have been doing long distance for the past year, where she's in Chicago and I'm in LA. The past month or so has been rocking because she doesn't want to move here, and I don't want to move home." Also, I fucked up a bit a few weeks ago. So every day when I drive to work, I see an ad for BackpagesPro.com, an adult entertainment website. So one day when things were rocky, I decided to peak my temptations and take a dabble into the dark. One thing led to another, and I ended up sending a dick pic to a hooker. Although I never intended to buy the hooker or ever do anything physical, I was just seeking some naughty pics and maybe some sexual communication. So when my girlfriend came to visit a few weeks ago, she went into my phone and looked at my recently defo- deleted photos and saw said dick pic. Obviously, she knew this didn't go to her, so I told her the truth about my shenanigans. We broke up on the spot, but then got back together towards the end of her stay. A few weeks go by, and she's driving down to see her friend at college, which happens to be my alma mater, and she calls me and says we need to break up. I thought it was sus, but she promised me she wouldn't hook up with anybody. On Sunday morning, she called me and I asked her if she hooked up with anybody and she said no. And we continued to hang out on FaceTime as normal. On the FaceTime, I get a call from my buddy and I tell my girlfriend, hold on, Murphy's calling me. I'm going to take this. My buddy Murphy spills me the deets and I'm devastated. My old buddy, a kid I used to live with, smashed the love of my life. I called her back and cussed her out. I then blocked her for four days until yesterday when I gave her a call. On the call, she pretty much explained that she wants me back or that she wants me in her life and that she's sorry. Side note, the exact same thing happened to me with the other girl I've loved. Therefore, I've always communicated to her that I have trust issues because of it and she would tell me that she would never do that to me and that I'm not your ex-girlfriend, so it stings extra worse. I don't know if I should give her another chance or block her forever. I feel like an in-between state would lead to more heartbreak. I still love and care about her, but I am totally torn. I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts. Sorry for the lengthy letters. Sincerely heartbroken, no stuff. Oh, God. Well, if it was a love of his life, I wonder why he's sending his dick pic to a prostitute. Right. So quickly after they they broke up. Yeah, it just sounds like you That's guys are to me. you guys don't know how to break it off because you're so attached to each other. But right. this has clearly run its course. Clearly, yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty toxic. If, you, if you're going back and forth, breaking up, getting back, I mean, it, it's. You don't want that in your life, and, and it, I, I can I can see too. I mean, I can understand totally how he feels like it's she's probably the only one, you know. Uh, but I, I I guarantee if you if you're able to break it off and get some space and get some time, you know, you you'll see that there are other people out there who are more compatible with you that you can have a you know loving peaceful relationship with sounds like there's a lot of anger in their relationship like there's yeah. vengeful behavior going back and forth and that it's hard to have any trust after that in my opinion and i think that's coming from i think they both resent the other one because they know that they don't actually want to be in the relationship or that the other person's right for them so they're almost doing bad things as a way to get that energy out and then still stay in the relationship like her after the, the hooking up with your buddy being like i really want you back and i want you in my life like to me that it probably feels genuine to her, but it sounds like guilt a little bit. And sometimes doing something wrong and then having guilt about it is a way to kind of stay in the in the relationship because you couldn't stay in it without it. So I don't know. I think it's yeah. I would just say later. I'd say later. Yeah. And, and and I think this guy needs to um, sorry be aware. What happened? I just feel bad that I said say later because oh. it sounds so casual. No, but, but I I think he has to be aware of his behavior and you know and you know the next time. You know, really think about what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sending a dong pic to a, a hooker sounds exciting. <laughs> is it? Is that considered a down payment? What, I mean, what is that? You think he was looking for a freebie, <laughs> dude? I had, I had a friend I lived an with. Estimate. We weren't really friends, yeah. but yeah, you get an estimate off that. I had a guy I lived with in Costa Rica, this British dude who was a real horn dog, and uh, he like fell in love with a hooker, <laughs> and he kept going out with her, and I'd be like, "Are you like paying her?" And then he was like, it's not like that. But he wouldn't answer. And then one day he came back from scenery. He's like, she left with another guy at the bar. I'm like, I don't think you can be mad, dude. <laughs> like, that's kind of the gig. Right. That's the gig. Yeah. yeah. Um, God bless him. Yeah. We miss him. But then I thought a, a girl I webcammed with had a, I thought we could potentially date, but was not to be. I like the idea that you get an estimate off of your dick pic, though. Like, yeah, I yeah. can do that for 200. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I get it? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
What's up, boys? Longtime listener and fan of the pod coming with a bit of dilemma. My friends and I graduated from college a year ago and moved into an apartment together in Chicago. Before moving down here, one of my roommates started dating this girl, and when we moved, they decided to go long distance. She moved out to New York. Seemed like a bad idea then, but we didn't really think it would last long. Fast forward to now, and our good friend used to be a lot of fun and routinely skipping nights out but is now routinely skipping nights out to FaceTime his girlfriend and flies out to visit her once a month for a week at a time. If he does come out with us, he's texting her the whole time, even though they talk 24 seven, it seems like whenever we go out or have a good time with him, she starts a fight with him and he has to stay home to talk to her. The fights they have are really unusual for 23 year olds who've been dating less than a year, i.e. how they need to raise their kids or how close they will need to live to her parents. The dilemma is that we are coming up on needing to sign a new lease in the next month or two, and we think he is seriously, seriously considering moving to New York for her instead. She's made it clear she would never come to Chicago. All of his friends agree that he hasn't really been himself since he started dating her, and we think it would be a mistake for him to move away from his life here to be with a girl who we think has some possessive and manipulative tendencies. Do we let him go out and find out for himself, or is it a big mistake? If it's a big mistake, or do we try and warn him even more to change his mind? Basically, they're asking, do we bulk the schmall? Right. That's it. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. I think you boke him. <laughs> Just cold. It doesn't feel like he's a. He, it doesn't. It doesn't sound like he's a uh, valued member of the squad anymore. Right. He's not focused on the squad he's at all. He's all consumed. Yeah, he's all consumed, and so he's not holding up his uh, his end of the bargain with the squad. Yeah, I agree, and and I think too, if they should talk to him too about um you know her i i always sort of was like you know let people do what they do and and you know if you try to step on their toes it'll you know it'll just it, it, it'll never work out the way you want it to you, you can't really tell people what to do but i you know in 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 in, in past relationships i had some friends say things like I, I don't think it's right and then i but maybe i and i was and I took that. I was like, "Oh, thank! You. Like, I appreciate you saying that." So, I think they could say that too. Yeah. Well, I think that's I, that's great. You did that, and I think that is the way to be. Like, I, I always think yeah. you should trust your friends and family because they're looking yeah. out for you. Yeah. But it doesn't sound like this guy is. You don't think he's reasonable? I don't think he's available to that kind of counsel. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. I think this dude sounds like he's dead set on like seeing this through to what will probably be a yeah. you know a fiery end yeah. but but if right. they're talking he's, about he's how they're gonna raise both. their kids and how yeah. close they are to her family it doesn't sound like he's committed to the squad much anyway I right mean, I've, I've fought with a lot of gf so we didn't make it to that point but we right. fought about that stuff you did yeah oh huh. but we didn't make it you know right. but like we'd be like you know five months into dating and i'd be like look i don't you know i was like super atheist at the time or something i was like i'm not raising my kids with faith you know right. I, I don't like it and then my girlfriend at the time would like cry and it was like <laughs> but but were you the schmoll in your friend group no i think i was still pretty because well here's the thing i would do is that i would go to my friends and be like i'm a fucking moron <laughs> and then they'd be like yeah you're dumb yeah. and then we could kind of move on right but but no i think most of them were pretty nice i mean i also was like my you know these were i, I was a late bloomer so maybe they were like I think they all got what I was going through. Like, I remember I called my buddy John and I was like, I'm having relationship problems. And, you know, I'd seen him dating people for like a decade before he saw me dating someone. Then he was like, you're just a nutcase, aren't you? You're just like, you're freaking out all the time. I was like, yeah. yeah. So like, they were kind of patient with me. But yeah, I mean, this dude, I don't know, man, it's tough when your friend's not where they were before. And, you know, it's like, they're not as fun to hang out with and they're kind of being a bummer. But I don't know if there's really much you can do. Yeah, I feel like... He you you could talk Maybe. her off of this girl. It, the next girl would be the same. Yeah, same. he's got some stuff he's got to figure yeah. out on his own, right? He's got to learn. Yeah, let the boking commence. Let the boking commence. But if Q purge sirens. But if he is such a beast that he can like hear you, I mean that's that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's worth it. But I don't know. Some people they just gotta. You got to you got to you got to you know he's young he's got to make have those experiences and sure learn. yeah. And and some people do. I don't know. I've seen, especially at that age, I had buddies who like, I saw them with their girlfriends at that time. And I was like, Oh, this is like not it. Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, they got married, they're yeah. married, they have kids and they're like super, super happy. Really? Mm hmm. As long as they can mature together through it and both kind of mature. Right. It's, it can work. 
Do I apologize? What up, Chad and JT, Aaron, and any other dank guests? I have a bit of a situation. A few years ago, I asked this girl out on a date. We knew a lot of the same people and would see each other around a lot. She went to college in a different state, but we made plans to get coffee when she came back for break. Long story short, we started texting a lot before she came back, and then we went on an actual date. We talked for a few hours, and it seemed like things could go somewhere. However, anytime I tried to text her and set up another date, she always said she had something going on. I obviously took this hint that she wasn't feeling it. At the time, I took it hard because I was going through some depression shit, and it felt like a hit to my personal and it felt like a hit to me personally i also didn't have much going on in my love life then love life then anytime i saw her after that i didn't really talk to her i don't think i was trying to ignore her but my ego had a hard time getting over being rejected i know it was super immature of me and I, it made a lot of tension anytime we saw each other around she just gradu graduated from college and now i'm seeing around her seeing her around all the time with covid restrictions lifting the tension is still there and i wish it wasn't i have a really hard time saying sorry to people but i'm working on being better at that should i just text her to try apologizing in person or should i just let it go since it was one date and it was two years ago thanks for any help andrew She's not thinking about this. Mm -hmm. One date two years ago? Honestly? Am yeah. I am I on an island? No, here? no, I, no, I totally no, agree no. with you. I, I mean, he, he, he put the answer there at the end. I would just uh, yeah. let it go. Yeah. Sorry, dude. One date two years ago? I mean, who remembers that? Yeah. If he, yeah, if he apologizes now, that's going to... She'd be like, what are you talking about? Right. Dude? And even if you're like a little... You're not like making her life inconvenient or hard or anything you're just like a little salty when you see her i mean yeah that's not ideal we'd all love to just you know not care about stuff like that but i think yours is contained enough where it's not something that you need to apologize about yeah if anything i think that's gonna spook her a little bit i think yeah. so too yeah. yeah yeah if you go up to her and you're like hey i'm sorry i've been acting weird to you because i'm still sad from two years ago she goes who are you she's gonna be like <laughs> it's okay and then you're gonna be like it's, I think you're almost just trying to find a way to re-engage with her so that you can like hopefully maybe spark it up again. But yeah. Do we know each other? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But wanna, that's wanna... not to say she's not going to regret it one day. Of course. <laughs> no, she'll, she missed out big time, but... Two but years you, ago. But you can't, you can't apologize for um, her not wanting to see you anymore. No. no. I, went on, I went on a couple dates with a girl like... I mean, it was, a, it was the MySpace era. That's how long ago it was. But like... Every New Year's Eve, she would send me like an apology for what for not for her not giving me a chance or something, and I was just like, "I've moved, I've moved on." What? It's so weird. Like, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a. Pretty, I appreciate it. It's the egocentric, run, but for like, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd say the solution is get busy with your own life, get things going, start. You know, get. Uh, how old is he? He's like 23, 24? Um. I don't know if he said. Yeah, I don't think yeah. he said. Yeah, but I, I, you know, get busy with what you're doing. You know, focus on that. Focus on yourself right. and and building your life. Now um, that's some good advice. Yeah, that's good advice. Then everything will come. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's the key, I think. Join a rec sports league. I can't recommend it enough. Yeah, I, I want <laughs> I, I want to do uh, softball maybe next year. So fun. I think I'm late. Um, all right. Last question. Summer hair for maximizing stoke. What up, counsel? I come to you today with a query regarding the lettuce. April last, I succumbed to the quarantine buzz and shaved my scalp. Since then, I've been on a redemption arc of regrowth and come to you today with a lion's mane just in time for summer. My question is this. What is the ideal length for a flow to be? And what are your thoughts on mullets? My hair is in a good place, but I'm curious about how to take it to the next fucking level. Thanks, boys. Tons of wisdom on the pod. Looking forward to hearing from you. Mm, good question. I think I tap out on this. I'm, you know, it's not my area of expertise. I don't really know much, you know. Come on. I mean, I'm not. You, 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 I like the, you know, you cut a nice, nice image. Mm. Hey, listen, you're a good looking guy and you dress well. I'm yeah. you're very kind to say that. But like, I, did this guy send a photo? Like, how long is his hair? Like, it, it, how are we to come to the conclusion of what's long enough, too long? And the the mullet thing, I think, is pretty well known that that's not a great way to go. It all depends. Right. Yeah, I think you're right. It depends on your facial structure. It depends on right. what kind of hair you have. It depends on the season. But to right. me, the ideal hair, besides Chad's, thanks, and then Paul's in the first Fast and Furious, the ideal hair is Brad Pitt's in Legends of the Fall. Oh right, yes. Were you thinking Brad Pitt in something else? Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but I, I like that more. Different, 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 yeah. different ideals. But yeah, well, it's like which Brad Pitt do you want to be? That's the big question he needs to ask himself. And right. Brad Pitt's hair in Legend of the Fall—it's different, equal length in Troy, but different. Yeah, you know, his is a little more sun-kissed in uh, Legends of the Fall. It feels like it's a the kind of color you get from riding horses in Montana. Yeah, 
Um, but I think that's the ideal length. So if you can pull that off, I'd, I'd go for it. Yeah. Buy a lot of conditioner. I totally agree. It's like, I, I think I'd look at all of, uh, Brad Pitt's filmography and choose, you know, do you, do I want to be Achilles? Do I want an Achilles vibe? Do I want to fight know, club? Fight, well, fight club. club was at the beginning of when he shaved his head. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was fight club. And yeah. then, uh, money is a good one too. Cause that's where he's like, He's a little more buttoned up, but he's still right. super hot. He's got some flow, but it works in the office. Yeah, he's he's got like, because and he's Jack too in that one. Um, but then Legends of the Fall, I mean, that's it's beautiful. Well, that's ideal for, I guess that's the male ideal, right? Legends of the Fall hair. Then. I think so. <laughs> yeah. And then, do, do yeah. we have an opinion on mullets? I I, I, no. I just in, I, I just don't see that working for someone right now. But maybe I, you know, I don't know. I'm punching up here, but I got to say, I, I, you know, I rewatched some of Theo Vaughn on Road Rules mm-hmm. and I missed his lettuce from that. I need to see his lettuce from Road Rules. It's pretty interesting because he has yeah. a lot of his like Theo Vaughn quality. Really? But the people around him don't get it. So he's kind of like the outcast on his season. Interesting. He's kind of like the sad guy. When you're talking about a mullet, I'm thinking Joe Dirt. Am I not thinking of this the right way? No, that's right. Yeah, there okay. are degrees of it for sure. Joe Dirt, yeah. one of the funniest movies of all time. Yeah. I, I think Theo has a more refined kind of mullet. Where okay. It's like, it, it's suitable for, you know, you can sort of... For everyday if, life. If people see it, they're like, oh, that guy's making a statement. If they see like Joe Dirt mullet, they're like, Something's off. Right. Something's mm. loose. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It also depends what you do for Correct. a living. Like, can you can you pull that off in a business setting? A yeah. mullet with Hard. a suit. I don't know. There is something yeah. like uh, Strider grew out a Jedi hair strap. Mm. Like one of those little ponytails that comes out is just kind of like a, a rat tail. Yeah, like a rat tail. And uh, but he was he was so swacked out he could pull it off. Right. But th- but that was also he was in college. Right. Would, would that work for him now? Maybe, but it's a it's a high it's a tougher sell for sure. Yeah. That's a hard sell. Um, the rat tail. I haven't seen that in a long time. So I gotta say, I think I think I'm Hayden against the mullet too. Wait, are you seeing Hayden Christensen's rat tail? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm I'm against the mullet. I I have a big question. What do you think of Hayden Christensen? Sorry, Hayden Christensen's portrayal of Anakin Skywalker. It's hard for me to divorce my passion for the first three Star Wars and then the fact that there was another Star Wars I was so jacked Mm -hmm. just to go back into that world Um, but it's interesting you bring that up because I was thinking like what where is Hayden what happened to him I mean it wasn't a bad portrayal at all I mean it was it felt a little dare I say thin like a little thin right but it wasn't bad but like I don't and he think it and was he, terribly well written. And that was the thing. He I had tough think. dialogue yeah, to deliver. He did. he did. And he he had to play brooding, but he wasn't really given like the You're right. the other parts to make to make that work. When when you think but about it But he did kind of but he did kind of suck. He kind of sucked. When you think about it, though, George Lucas didn't has not directed that many movies. Like no. So uh, is he a good actor's director? I don't know. No. Not a good actor's director. He made a right? good choice with the hair. Sure. Wait, George Lucas didn't direct that movie, did he? Did yeah, he, he did all the yeah. three the three prequels, yeah. He did? Yeah. All three. For better or worse. Well, and that was that was with what? Like <laughs> thir- probably 30 years of <laughs> You're right, between. you're right, you're right, yeah, you're right. Yeah. 30 years of between. Because he directed movie. the original Star Wars and then... American Graffiti. American Graffiti. And then his like, college THX movie. THX 1138. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Good and stuff. then those prequels. Because everything else he just produced. And then J.J. directed the first one after those three. Yeah. Okay. The Ryan Johnson. And there's and people who say like that the first Star Wars was like rescued by uh I know everyone gets help, but a lot of people say it was rescued in the edit. Like that he kinda gave them like a a mess. And then it was this isn't a huge thing, but it was like De Palma's idea to put the scroll at the top of it. Hmm. Like cause no one understood the movie, and then Brian De Palma was like, Yo, you just gotta like just write out what's happening. <laughs> and then the audience That's will be amazing. able to like, make heads or tails of it. I think yeah. I did read that in a book. Yeah, Easy Riders and Raging yeah, Bulls. Yeah, that's right. That's where I read that. They did casting nice. together, too, yeah. It could yeah. have been William Cat and uh, Coal Miner's daughter. What's her name? Sissy Spacek. Oh, she's oh, such really? a good actress. Yeah. But not right they for did, Princess Leia. Yeah, they no. did Carrie and, and Star Wars at the same time. She's perfect for Carrie. Yeah. yeah. She's, there's a heaviness to her that I don't know if it works in the Star Wars yeah, yeah. galaxy. Right. Yeah, I, I think Hayden's due for a comeback. For, yeah, I think so, too. I believe in him. 
I love that. He, dude, life is a house. He plays like a sad prostitute drug addict. Oh, really? I thought he was phenomenal. Really? Him and Kevin Klein. Interesting. Yeah, he was good in that stuff. I like that idea. You like it? Bringing him back. I, I, I think like he's that. Doing, I, I think he, I think he got a little bit screwed because of the writing, right. and I think he, you know, he, he got dealt sort of a, you know, I mean, he got an amazing role. But um, what about him and Ahmed Best, who played Jar Jar? Yeah, the, I think they're a cop movie. They're yeah, That's they're good. unfairly maligned. And I, I, if, uh, if they come back, Jar Jar too. I don't. Know, the guy who voiced him, maybe. <laughs> I love it. No support I, him. I, You're I, the only guy here, I, dude. I, I never you got to do this. I never want to see Jar Jar again in my life. <laughs> no, not Jar Jar, but the actor. But know, the yeah. actor, not the character. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> well, they, do, have you seen that with actors where like I, you know I guess that's like Travolta in Pulp Fiction a little bit is like after they've hit their zenith and then they come back down to they crash land land back on earth but then sometimes it seems like they come out of that like humbled in a way that helps their acting uh, yeah for sure i mean you know that's a great career i mean yeah that's we're what rooting you're for about. that guy yeah. yeah you're rooting for that guy i mean when's the last time you guys watched saturday night fever uh like three years ago four years ago yeah i, I don't know john travolta's acting in that he should have it, it's unbelievable what? i think he was nominated he should have won it's yeah. unbelievable how good he was the charisma him. all of it the this, whole the thing. sadness too. I, yeah, I just watched it. Sad movie. So depressing. But people don't remember it that way because it's got... Da- no. Magic Mike's a little bit like that too. People just remember the dancing right. when you watch it. It's kind of a bummer. Yeah. yeah. But Travolta, you got to go back. It's worth it just to watch what he did with that role. It's incredible. It's and little, he was on... You know, it's a little problematic, that movie though. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> but it seems like it's aware of its problem. Like, it's yeah, judging the characters yeah, for it. It's not yeah. like... It's not reveling in it at all. It's, it's sad. Yeah, yeah. 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 But uh, having not seen it in a while, I don't want to gets you the opening of that movie um, creates more so much energy it's so good and it's all about that music that yeah. music was do you know if a movie how, how soon into a movie do you know if it's going to be good or not can you tell from like the first frame no 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 i think uh yeah there's a like martin amos's dad he was like an english writer I think his name was like kingsley amos or something he said he, he'd like read the first sentence of a book he'd be like trash Oh, then he yeah. throw like That's catcher in the rye across the. the <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that book either. I wish yeah. I could. I'd have a lot more time on my hands if I could discern it that quickly. <laughs> wow, that'd be great to go home. What about with the script? script? Can you tell right away with the script? Well, no. But I, I read a script last weekend. I'm reading the first thirty pages. I am so psyched. I'm like, this is tense, phenomenal. And by page fifty, I just put it down. It was so you know. Mm. Sometimes that can happen. Like the idea just doesn't hold on. Mm. It's a shame when it happens, for sure. What are, are screenwriters, or what are they like? Because I just read Get Shorty, and they're kind of treated like the lowest class citizen that's of, not the, true, of the filmmaking hierarchy, at least I, of like the above the line people. Yeah, I no, I don't think that's true. I, I think it, th- there is a tremendous amount of respect. I mean, if you're giving actors great words to say, everyone loves you. It might have been different. That movie w- felt like an exaggeration of... They're really turning it yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. But and it was written by a writer who maybe felt like... Uh, yeah, maligned. Because in the beginning, you know, they don't necessarily... You know, you don't have the same power or the same ability to get things done the way you do after you've sold some things and made profitable things. It's the same thing we talked about with a director or even an actor. Mm. Um, do you guys want to do Beefs, Babes, and Legends? Let's do it. Chad, who is your Beef of the Week? Uh, my Beef of the Week is with Kim Jong-un. Um... I don't know if you guys heard, but he banned mullets and skinny jeans. Is that true? Yeah. Wow. Oh, well, now I'm pro-mullet now that I know it's illegal. Right. Yeah, and I'm, you know... Theo Vaughn's pro-sarn on grotto there. Yeah, I'm just going to say, you know, he crossed the line. He crossed the line. He finally went too far for you? Yeah. It's interesting to me that that made it on his radar. Yeah. And what's his beef? Right. What's the problem? What's the problem? Is it is it because he you know doesn't look good in skinny jeans? Maybe. And you you we had talked about it and you were like, dude, I'm not. I was like, what do you think about him? You're like, I'm not cast in judgment yet. Right. Like, it's still yeah. it's still TBD. I like to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, but when they go it's from nice. they, when they go for my fashion choices, uh, you know, it's, right. that, that's really kind of I, that felt personal to me. Uh, you know, to to explicitly say no skinny jeans, and, and that's something I you know I I cherish, and 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 I want the opportunity to have and i want that for the people of north korea too right yeah well you did you made a video of you in really skinny jeans right saying like hey i'm here and we hear you and i see you for and i'll be walking around in these for kim 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sent to, it to, to the him. people of North Korea so that they can know that we were thinking about them. Yeah, I, I, I sent it through, you know, a uh, a, a sort of blacklist, encrypted, or, or, uh, you know, through the dark web uh, carrier. Um, so we'll see. Um, maybe it'll make a difference. But I, I was pretty passionate. I, it was good lighting, and uh, JT was coaching me on it. So that's cool. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think I really delivered a lot of passion and i think you know and i did it in korean oh wow so, yeah wow that's super impressive yeah and i didn't touch on taiwan at all good that would yeah yeah it hurt the financial viability if that video ever gets monetized yeah right? totally totally so. you're losing out on about a third yeah so that's my beef just great beef brad what's your beef i don't think you guys are going to like this or appreciate it but my beef is with my dong and my bladder hmm. we're not going to appreciate that well I don't think you were you're talking to the dong this. problem. King. I know, but but here's the thing: every single night at two thirteen, I wake up to have to go to pee, mm -hmm. and it's ruining my sleep. My aura ring is telling me that I'm not having good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. Apple Watch is telling me, and, and I don't know why I have to battle with myself. Right, right. It just should just should just be able to sleep through the night. Every night at two thirteen, as if they're looking at the watch. The dong and the bladder look at the watch, right. and, they, and 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 then I have to serve them. Yeah, so that's my beef. What do you? I mean, that's my beef. That really is. I, it's a great beef. I totally relate to that. I mean, I have to. You know, I have a small bladder. Strider and I both actually. I really. You know, he and I bond over how much we have to pee. Yeah. And when I'm going to bed, yeah, you know, I, I have to. You know, it's if I have like I'll have like a little bit like thing of water with like a little supplement to sleep. Um. I'll, I'll go to the bathroom probably like three times just because I'm, I'm like, I need to get it all right. out so I don't wake up in the middle of the night. It's right. so frustrating. And I'm only 30 now. And I'm like, right. am I in for a world of just like bladdered hurt? You're, you're looking at me right now. And the answer is a resounding yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. My, my brother, my brother too, he's, he, he told me he's like, it only gets worse. I'm like, it only gets worse. It's so you, bad. You know what helped? This is a weird thing that I do and not maybe it, it, it it's weird, but it, it works as I tape my mouth shut. So I'm only doing nasal breathing. And that... You're still doing that? Yeah. The consistency. And that... Phenomenal. And that... Uh, when you do... When you only breathe through your nose at night, that... Um, I read this book called, like, uh, from James Nestor about breathing. That helps you to... Now I don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to pee. Are you serious? Mm-hmm. This could be the most important thing that's happened this month. I'll, I'll, I'll text you the book... Please. James Nestor, just so you know, it's like a legit technique. Because everyone I tell it to, they're like, that's insane. Why would you do that? You get, like, you know, but my brother and I both do it. And it's like, our sleep is so much better. Um, I wake up feeling rested, even if I only get like six hours. And, you know, now I wake up at like 5.30 to pee. So I would love that. So yeah. what kind of tape do you use? It's like a, it's like a medical tape. It's very, uh, you know, non-abrasive. Um yeah, I can send you a photo. I want to like, see that. I'm going to yeah. do that. The next time I come on, we're going to talk about it. it yeah. I, it, it's weird and people are going to, you know, it, but it's it really works and it, it, it has changed my sleeping for sure. I mean, it's conceivable that when I yeah. see you next that the, the babe of the week will be that tape and that book. Yeah. God willing. That would be yeah. amazing. Thank I hope you. it fixes it for thank you. Thank you, Chad. I appreciate that. Yeah. Really. Let's go. Thank you. Hell yeah. That's nice. I'm I'm excited for you to try it. I'm going to try it. My uh my beef of the week is with uh, a little incident that happened on Sunday. I was in Huntington Beach with the lady I've been seeing, and we went for a nice walk on the uh, on the on the sand at night. And then there's just a lot of people there, mm -hmm. a huge collection of people, huge group of people, mostly young. They look like high school kids, and there's kind of a rowdiness going around. Like you know, once it says walk on the on this on the the street people are just barreling across and it, it's starting to get like uh i don't know like the huntington beach just won like the nfl uh super they just won the super bowl and uh so i, I see a group of cops there and i go up to them like what's going on they're like oh just a lot of kids with energy to burn off and then the cops just peel off and start running come around the corner and kids are just beating the shit out of the cop car mm -hmm. and then i'm like whoa i gotta i gotta see what's going on yeah so i start talking to people and i guess what happened is is this kid adrian put up a tiktok saying that he was gonna have a party in Huntington Beach, like at the pier. 
and uh, it ended up going viral. It got 400,000 likes. Oh, there was yeah. kids there from Oregon, from like Arizona. I was like interviewing kids trying to, I was like, no one knew Adrian. Yeah. I asked like 20 different kids. I'm like, do you know Adrian? They're like, uh, yeah, I think he's in my buddy's chem class at like the school down the street, but no, I don't know him personally. And the kids were just raging. They were letting off fireworks. They were climbing light towers. Um, you were hearing rumors. They're like, oh, the cops are shooting rubber bullets. Someone just got stabbed. And uh, I was loving it. Yeah. We almost got stampeded. I had to get me and the lady out of the way before these marauding teens go by. But at one point, I almost pushed it too far. We were walking back. We were like, all right, we got enough of this. We got to get out of here. We got to stay safe. So we started walking back to the hotel we were staying at. And these two kids just come running down, just barreling down. I go, hey, dudes, you got to slow down. And this little blonde punk who's like 110 pounds soaking wet with more menace in his face than I've ever seen turns me. She goes, fuck you, bitch. <laughs> and then I was like, huh. And I was like, I'm sorry, man. And he was like, and he's kept staring me down. Dude, the palpable fear I had in my body. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I turned to the girls. I was, I was like, hey, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I was like, let's keep moving. Mm -hmm. So my beef is with me thinking I can hang with these kids. I mean, you, you looked into this kid's eyes. He was ready to go all the way with me. He was ready to 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 take it to the end, and I was like, "I'm not there, dude." Yeah, I was like, "You know, I got." Did you get him on ca on camera? Not that kid. No, oh. I got a bunch of other kids on camera. Most of them didn't. Most of the kids were really smart. I was like, "Yo, can I film you talking about this?" They're like, "No, I don't want to do that." I was like, "Yeah, you're smart. You don't want to like say that you were here and it's kind right. of a scene." So, but I got one really sweet guy on camera who was just really nice about it. And actually, at, at the end, he said he he, he wanted to go because he thought it'd be romantic for him and his lady to see like all the fireworks <laughs> and he was genuine he was really sweet but it was crazy it was a really crazy scene and then they ended up having to call in curfew these kids were really letting it rip it looked this insane is, on your story this is how the purge is going to start for real <laughs> it's not going to be yeah. the government saying go for it it's going to be a kid on tiktok probably like, true meeting at this intersection it, fucking purge it, it felt purgy it had that energy yeah. did, did what's that movie from the 80s with matt Dillon where he's like uh, it's about high school kids and they're kind of like wayward red dawn not that one. It's like, uh, and in the end, all the parents go to a, uh, they go to like a PTA meeting and the kids lock them in the building and they kind of riot outside. God, I know what you're talking about. It really I, stuck I out of my head when I was a kid, but is I that, that movie. It, it had that vibe though. It had like the, the kids are in charge hmm. now and they're, they got a lot of energy and anger towards hypocrisy, hmm. but it was also nice. They had the, the, the glad flag was high in the air. Hmm. So I was like, all right, at least it's people from every, you know, right. What's that stand for? Yeah, like for the gay, lesbian. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. Uh, it was, you could... Uh, Asexual? Like, I don't know if they're covered in there. Maybe, though. But it was like, uh, you could feel that... Uh, it was nice that it was people of every stripe uh, beating the shit out of that cop car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. Chad, cool. Is it Over the Edge? Yeah. So yeah, it's 1979. Good call. Oh, it's way old. That's a really good movie. And a group of bored teenagers rebel against authority in the community of New Granada after the death of one of their own. Well, I saw the twenty one twenty one version. It was Adrian's kickback. Oh, that was the best part too. It was describe everyone kept calling it a kickback. Yeah. <laughs> some of the I saw some of the footage of the fireworks going off. That was insane. It was really intense. There were like a lot of people around. Mm -hmm. And they were just moving in like uh zombie waves. Like it'd just be like five hundred people. Yeah. And uh yeah, I felt like I was. I I, I sent all of my videos to Vice oh, did as you? an audition tape. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's I'm, cool. I'm ready to get in the field. Send me to yeah. wherever cannibals are. Um, nice. There's a lot of weird like group activities like that. Like the people who who watch people do donuts, like and just kind of flash mob a uh, intersection. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it happens in the valley all the time. It's the, very strange. The ability of people to quickly organize. It's yeah. uh, exciting and terrifying. Hmm. Yeah. Chad, what's your baby of the week? Uh, my baby of the week is my brother. Uh, my brother was in town last week, and we uh, we had a good time. I, uh, I I saw him over the holidays, but you know during COVID, I haven't seen much of my family. So it was nice that we got to spend some time together. We uh, first night he came, we ate steak, we did an ice bath, we played GTA. Next day, we went to Disneyland. It was awesome. Um, we got churros. We did Space Mountain, Splash Mountain. All the Star Wars stuff. The uh, new ride? Some California. What's up? The new ride? No, I couldn't get on Damn. the new ride because the, like, I didn't realize that you need to get in like the queue online yeah, yeah. like the night before. And I, I wasn't aware of that system. Yeah, so yeah. It sucks. Couldn't see that. But we did do Millennium Falcon. And with the COVID restrictions, you are in like the, the ride by yourself, which is cool. That's cool. Um, and we had a good time. And then he came to the show, which was great. He hung out with, uh, with JT Strider, Joe. And Joe's like... 
you look like Chad. And he's like, yeah, I'm his brother. He's like, oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was a good show, good too. To you it. crushed. It was, good. it was a fun show. Strider crushed. Joe Strider. crushed. Everyone yeah. crushed, too. Everyone crushed. Um, Joe really crushed. He had a great set. He, he, came, out, he came out with some heat. Um, and uh, But, yeah, it was just great to see him. He, he's, he's the best. So uh, And, yeah, I love you, Mark. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah. I really like that. We had a good time. Oh, he has a daughter Walter. too. By the way, he because he's such like a he's more kind of like really kind of masculine, yeah. you know, and just kind of like emotionally a little bit harder than I. He's jacked. Too. Yeah, he's jacked. And I'll be like, "How are you doing?" He's like, "Good." You know that kind of like mm-hmm. he's very kind of stoic, I guess you could say. But he has a daughter, and he's just like crazy about his daughter. So when he when you see him look at photos of his daughter, or whatever, it's just like the the look of joy on his face is just it's so cool to see he just like starts giggling that's nice <laughs> yeah. that's how old's the daughter two wow yeah dude i could cry right now thinking about my daughter right yeah so awesome yeah. what do i have to say to get you to cry <laughs> <laughs> uh, brad who's your baby of the week my baby of the week is advil pm nice i mean as we've discussed i've had you know it's been a you know challenging week and hard to fall asleep and Advil PM is always there for me in a very gentle way and it rocks me to sleep and despite the 213 awaking I go right back to sleep if I've taken Advil PM it just feels like it's always there for me that's nice don't abuse it don't take it more than you know a couple nights in a row mm-hmm. but we, on that occasion where you really need a good night's sleep it's solid yeah I love that stuff my baby of the week is man is what is your phone causing that noise? Oh, is that my phone that's doing that? I think Maybe. so. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, because I just wanted to check if mangoes were in season because they have been <laughs> bomb lately. Really? I've just been having some tasty mango. I grew up on mango. You had some before the show. I ate a full box of it. Yeah, I it's saw already that. sliced. Yeah. You can tell when you see it in the in the clear container too if it's yeah. good mango because it's a little deeper of a yellow. Yeah. And it looks like it's kind of softened at the edges. You don't want that mango with those like you know, hard, like Tetris kind of cube ends, you know, you want it to be that soft kind of melted mango. Yeah. And that's what they've been serving up lately at the grocery store. And I'm just, I know I love it. I think it's the best fruit in the world. Yeah. I grew up on it. My mom always had a lot of it at the house. You know, it's also fun when you just peel it and you just bite straight into that guy. Mm-hmm. You get the juices everywhere. Nice. It's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's my favorite fruit. Hell yeah. Chad, who's your legend of the week? Um, my legend of the week uh is movie theaters uh fitting for this episode yeah uh yeah i just i've been going to the movies i'm gonna keep going to the movies we're seeing a quiet place too tomorrow very excited stoked uh and uh it's just i don't know i you know the whole covid year i was kind of like you know you everyone was kind of isolated i was alone in my apartment but i'm i'm i don't mind being alone so i was kind of like yeah i'm good i'm you know i'm i'm fine like i'm i'm cruising it's all good. But then I started doing things that, you know, just going to sh- comedy shows, hanging out with comics. That, that's that been huge. Uh, and then going to the movies. And it was just like, you know, you, you don't really realize how much you really miss something until you get to experience it again. Like, I, I just wasn't even thinking about it. And then, you, you know, you go to the movies and it's just like, it's unreal. So, um, yeah, I, it's just good to be back at... Going to the movies is one of my favorite activities, so yeah, that's my babe. Nice, dude. Yeah. Get out to the theaters this weekend, guys. Totally. And every Please. weekend after. Please. Yeah. You won't regret it. Can I can I call you on Friday? Like as the I want you as to. the receipts are rolling in? Uh, absolutely. Alright, I'm calling you every day because this is like Great. let's do it together. This I is the most exciting this. thing that's ever happened to me. Let's go. <laughs> I'm ready. I am so ready. I need the help. I've never been this close to a big movie dropping call me all the time i'm always available you know that real quick have you had a movie that performed well under expectations that performed what like under expectations of course how do you get to the other side of that it's part it's the business it's just just what it is you just roll and luckily the first two were good so i had a little bit of i had a little bit of optimism like, in the bank yeah and so when a couple of them after that didn't work i, I knew that there were going to be ups and downs i always said to 
to Allie, you know, this you're getting on a roller coaster ride. This is what our life is going to be. And so is that first W? That's pretty pivotal, huh? What? Yeah, the first one to get the first one to be a success. So you kind of feel like, dude, it's, it's a, a positive business yeah, because otherwise, uh, yeah, it's hard to it, when you taste that. It's hard to you know, you want it so badly again, and then you also, when you don't have it, maybe even work harder to get back to it. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Who's your uh, legend of the week? Well, I'm going to draft on what Chad said, kind of, but I, I, and it sounds bullshitty, but it's really authentic. I think it was a very courageous thing for the Paramount, for Paramount Pictures to, a long time ago, I said 10, 11, 12 weeks ago, decide to let this movie come out theatrically. I know they were offered, you know, other ways to release the movie and they, they hung true and, and, you know, in our business, that's a, you know, there was so much unknown. You just kind of jumped off the cliff and hoped that things would open up. And, you know, this is not an inexpensive movie. And they put a lot of money towards marketing. And to take that risk, I they, they have to be my legend of the week. Just all, the, you know, particularly the marketing staff at Paramount. But from the chairman of the board, Jim Giannopoulos, on the, all the way down, they, you know, they picked a date. And here we are. And hopefully, you know, when you call me on Friday, I, I'm in a really excited mood. I got a good feeling on it. Thanks. Me too. Uh, my legend of the week is uh, Cole. Cole was a young dude who worked at the hotel I was staying at, and I ran into him the day after uh, Adrian's kickback, and uh, we struck up a conversation. He was like a fan and stuff. Super nice guy. And uh, I was like, dude, were you at Adrian's kickback yesterday? He's like, and you know, I'm, I'm not judging anyone who went to it. It was exciting. I wanted to be there. But I have respect for this dude, because I was like, hey, were you there? And he's like, no, nah, dude, I couldn't participate in that, dude. He's like, you know, I'm trying to be on my thing. I'm trying to be responsible. And uh, you know, I got these things I got to take care of. And I was like, you're a beast, dude. Yeah. That's cool. Nice, Cole. It takes a lot of power not to go to that. How old is Cole? He was probably like 19. And he had that already that mindset that he's going to he win. He was so mature. Good for Cole. Yeah, because I'm 33 and I was like dragging the girl I was with. I was like, we got to get in there. <laughs> I like, then I ran into Cole the next day. He's like, no, dude, it didn't feel right for me. And I was like, God damn, dude. Right, I was like, good. thanks for the lesson, dude. Uh, Chad, what's your quote of the week? Uh, my quote of the week, uh, I've, been, I've been on an American Pie bender of quotes. So this one comes from American Pie 2, uh, one of the you know first scenes of the movie at Stifler's house party. Stifler, you know, thinks he's getting a champagne shower and he. You know, someone actually pees on his head, and he emerges, and he goes, I got peed on. That's nice. my quote. Yeah. He owned it. He owned it, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I can taste the bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> What's your uh, quote of the week? Well, JT, my quote of the week is something that you said, which is, um, work that ass. <laughs> like that that made me laugh so hard when you were talking about getting massaged at 11 years old and you're telling some masseuse to work your ass i thought that was really very funny so so that's i'm going with that work, work, that's the quote right work that ass yeah my parents raised me to be bold um, <laughs> well that that was you bold want. yeah i laughed my ass off yeah that was good um my quote of the week i think it's maybe uh it's in my like top i'd say and this movie has a couple scenes like this, but it's probably my top 20 scenes of all time. It's uh, Joe Pesci and Ray Liotta in Goodfellas. It's early in the film, and uh, Joe Pesci tells a funny story about effing with the cops when they were inter interrogating him, and then uh, Ray Liotta goes, you're funny. And then Joe Pesci, who's like a mad murderer in the movie, like crazy mob guy, takes offense, and he's like, funny how? Like, what do you mean funny? And he's like, I don't know, you're funny. He's like, what do you mean, like I amuse you? Like I'm a clown? Like how am I funny? And then the other guys who are there get uncomfortable and they try to step in to protect Ray Liotta's character. And they're like, they're like, he's, he's just talking. He's like, hey, he's like, hey, he's a grown man. He can explain it. How am I funny? Funny how? And then Ray Liotta takes a beat. He just goes, get the fuck out of here. And then Joe Pesci just dies laughing. He's been <laughs> fucking with them the whole time. And like, I know it's so real, but it's so fun. The, the way the scene starts with like the funny and then gets tense and then goes back to the funny. It's just a... Uh, I don't know. I don't know why it's so great, but there's just something no, in it that's like... It is so great. That yeah. scene, you got to pull up that scene tonight. It's such a great scene. And their outfits, he's got the weird yeah. suit with like the uh, the collar that covers the whole tie. And I don't know, it's just all perfect. And I guess that was born out of improvisation. It was like something that Joe Pesci had seen in his life, told Martin Scorsese about it. Martin Scorsese was like, all right, we got to put that in the movie. And then they just worked it out. And it's like, 
I know it just adds so much life to it. And then the other scene from that movie would be when they're cooking dinner in prison. Um, right. And he's slicing the, uh, the garlic. All right, uh, Chad, what's your uh, phrase of the week for getting after it? My phrase of the week for getting after it is... Um I'm gonna wear a fedora. Hmm. Nice, dude. Are you? Yeah. Tonight, yeah. Dude. That's cool. Just hanging at home solo? Yeah. Just around the house. Yeah. Yeah. I like I'm it. doing the open mic. I'm gonna do I'm gonna wear it at the open mic. That's a good move. Yeah. You doing a flashback? Um at the Hollywood. Have you heard of it? No. It's on Melrose. Oh, okay. I had no idea it existed. Same same setup style as the other ones? Yep. Sign up style? Yep. Um Brad, what's your phrase that we're going after it? Well, we're going into Memorial Day, so I was thinking, let's smoke the meat. Nice. Um, That's a good one. Thank you. Let's smoke the meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My phrase of the week is from this book I'm reading called The Argonauts. Um, and uh, she says in it, artistry trumps mastery. That fired me up. That's cool. I think it's true. All right, dude, yeah. Brad, thanks for coming in before the big weekend. Guys, I love being here. Aaron, thank you for all you do. Yeah. Chad, JT. It's great this to is, see you. This is the best. I don't do any other podcasts. Oh, we, we appreciate It's an exclusive. Oh, very I very much well, appreciate I love this, and you know, you guys know I love the Stern show. Um, but And you said schmoll on the, uh, I did. the wrap-up it, show I did, for us. I did. Did you? Yeah. Get, yeah. I heard oh, it, yeah. Oh, you it did hear great. it? Yeah, well, I wish good. I could have done more, but whatever. No, great. that was a beautiful thing to drop thank in you, there. Thank you, thank you. But Much I love being here every time, guys. Thanks for having me back. Oh, it's great to see you. you Stokers, too. go watch Quiet Place 2 this weekend. You gotta go see it. You gotta. Or I guess when will this come out? I'm gonna try and put it out early next week, like Monday, so that we can okay. kind of yeah, hopefully go, capitalize a little bit. Go see A Quiet Place 2 now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Going right now. Right, well, we'll yeah. post about it. More people will see yeah. the post. Right. Yeah, probably, too. Nice. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah. yeah. No, we're fired up on it. Me too. Thanks for the fruit smash. What'd you think? Delightful and refreshing. They're good guys. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I liked it. Let's smash. All right. All right. Thank you guys. These guys are really not.